Halo, selamat pagi. Halo. Selamat pagi, Bu Valentin. Selamat pagi, Selamat pagi, Mbak Linda, Bu Marlinda, Bu Judith, dan Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, Mem, untuk panelis saya masukkan ke breakout room dulu ya. Silahkan. Halo, selamat pagi semua. Selamat pagi semua. Selamat pagi. Halo Bapak Ibu Panitia, mau tanya kalau breakout room itu buat apa ya? Sorry Sir Andreas, tadi di info kalau misalnya panelis digabungin ke breakout room mungkin Sir bisa ke sana. Oh, Oke, okay, ya. Jadi saya join ini kalau di invite uh, masuk room satu, ya. Oke. Okay. Iya, sir.
Kristina ini... sudah masuk gak di main room? Coba cek. Aku nggak oh, bisa lihat. Ini saya jadi inkos dulu yang ada di sini. Belum ada. Saya masuk dulu. Tapi di catatan Mama Alin ada nggak? Eh di, di partisipan sudah gak masuk ada, gak? karena dia Hah? belum ada. Mungkin bu boleh dibilang uh, try again. Siapa tahu tadi yang masuk yang pertama, yang pertama kan harus registrasi. Kalau ini nggak lagi langsung otomatis. Oh wait, aku kirim lagi lah ke dia sebentar ya. A pleasant day to all. The Faculty of Business Universitas Advent Indonesia aims to educate business students with professionalism and develop competence. The Faculty of Business equips students with strong leadership skills and train them to be a socially and morally responsible individuals. The Faculty of Business integrates faith, character, and learning, thus values are embedded on them, thus making them contributor to the development of Indonesian society. At the Faculty of Economics, Universitas Advent Indonesia, students will learn about resource management strategies by considering their efficiency in attaining prosperity. The resources are not merely about money or costs, but also natural resources, time, and even energy. In the accounting study program, students will learn materials related to methods of journaling and preparing financial reports that are useful for the stakeholder in the decision-making process. Students will also learn management, tax section, information system, and auditing. And for Master of Management, students will learn how to manage a company or organization, wherein management focus more on managing and planning all the process within company or organization to achieve goals. The Faculty of Economics of the Universitas Advent Indonesia also provides various learning facilities such as manual accounting labs and computer labs and of course with quality teaching staff from reputable universities both local and abroad to help the learning process become better and efficient in preparing us for the future work. Students and graduates of Economic Faculty of Universitas Advent Indonesia are trained to carry out community services by implementing economic, both accounting and management, and professional that they are able to meet the needs in community life, the world, business, and government. For all prospective students who are still confused about where to study and are interested in taking up economics, accounting, or management, let's join us at Universitas Advent Indonesia, where your dreams will be your success. Nama saya Yosi William Irot. Saya Angkatan tahun 97 dan tamat tahun 2002 dari Universitas Advent Indonesia. Saya jurusan akuntansi. 
jadi di Fakultas Ekonomi. Sekarang saya bekerja sebagai Direktur Operasional di PT Asuransi BRI Life. Tanggung jawab saya mencakup bidang layanan, operasional asuransi, product development, IT, dan juga unit usaha syariah. Pengalaman saya di dunia asuransi sudah hampir 20 tahun. Tapi saya memulai karir saya sebagai seorang admin, administrasi, tukang cetak polis sebutnya di perusahaan asuransi. Jadi yang mengetik, menginput, dan juga mencetak polis dan mengirimkan semua polis kepada nasabah. Tapi ketika saya bekerja di posisi yang rendah ini, di posisi permulaan ini, saya tetap belajar mengenai produk-produk asuransi, belajar mengenai proses asuransi, sehingga di kemudian hari ketika saya mendapatkan kesempatan untuk bisa mempresentasikan produk asuransi, menjelaskan proses layanan asuransi, akhirnya pimpinan perusahaan bisa melihat adanya potensi yang ada di dalam diri saya. Dari memulai karir sebagai tukang cetak polis di PT Asuransi AIA Indonesia, saya uh, berkarir selama 8 tahun, dan puji Tuhan, dalam 8 tahun saya bekerja, saya dipromosikan sekitar 7 kali. Dari staff sampai menjadi seorang asisten vice president di grup and credit operation. Setelah di AIA atau AFRIS, saya uh, bekerja di perusahaan Zurich Insurance Indonesia, saya ke sana untuk melakukan perubahan di bidang layanan dan operasional ketika perusahaan ingin bisa berkompetisi di retail market di general insurance di Indonesia. Setelah itu, saya melanjutkan karir saya di Chartis Assurance atau AIG sebagai Consumer Solution and Innovation. Dan akhirnya, saya pindah ke perusahaan bernama PT Asuransi Jiwa Manulife Indonesia di mana saya memulai karir sebagai Vice President di Project Management Office dan di tahun 2016 saya menjadi Chief Transformation Officer sebelum di tahun 2017 di usia saya yang masih 36 tahun saya dipercayakan oleh PT Asuransi Jiwa Manulife dan juga setelah melalui fit and proper test di usia saya baru saya 36 tahun pertama kali saya menjadi seorang Direktur di perusahaan asuransi jadi Direktur transformasi. Setelah menyelesaikan tugas saya di Manulife, saya menjadi country CEO di AXA Indonesia. Saya sebagai country CEO, jadi saya uh, mengawasi uh, kelima perusahaan AXA yang ada di Indonesia dan bertanggung jawab untuk melakukan perubahan, melakukan peningkatan layanan dan memastikan bahwa transformasi teknologi dan digital bisa berjalan dengan baik. Sebelum pada akhirnya di tahun 2021, saya bisa berkarya di perusahaan yang merupakan anak perusahaan dari Bank BRI. Ya, dari Bank BRI yang merupakan salah satu dari State of Enterprise atau perusahaan badan usaha milik negara. Ketika berkuliah di UNAI, banyak sekali ilmu yang saya peroleh. Dari ilmu bergaul dengan sesama teman. Dari ilmu berdisiplin ketika harus bangun pagi-pagi setiap jam 5 untuk bersiap mengikuti semua kegiatan dari kegiatan worship, kegiatan uh, makan pagi, kegiatan kelas, bahkan saat itu masih ada study period di mana kami harus masuk ke library untuk bisa belajar, mengerjakan homework dan sebagainya. Semua keteraturan, semua disiplin, itu saya banyak belajar ketika saya masih di UNAI. Kebetulan waktu di UNAI saya pun bisa mencicipi pengalaman menjadi seorang student labor. Jadi saya pun pernah bekerja saat libur, membersihkan seluruh asrama, membersihkan WC, kamar, merapikan semua, sampai nanti ketika masih soal balik, semester barunya mereka sudah bisa menikmati tempat atau asrama yang, yang bersih. Ini pun membutuhkan satu kerendahan hati, perjuangan, dan juga disiplin. Sampai akhirnya saya dipercaya menjadi monitor, mengawas satu lantai, ada 31 kamar, satu kamar ada 4 mahasiswa, jadi lebih dari 120 mahasiswa yang saya harus awasi. Ya. Jadi ini pun bagaimana saya bisa memiliki bukan hanya pengalaman bekerja, tapi merasakan adanya tanggung jawab untuk mengawasi, bahkan bisa dikatakan untuk membina adik-adik tingkat saya untuk mengarahkan mereka agar bisa berdisiplin dengan baik 
agar tidak mendapatkan ganjaran seperti daftar ulang atau dikeluarkan dari UNAI. Walaupun ketika saya memulai perkuliahan saya di UNAI, saya bukanlah mahasiswa yang bisa dibanggakan. Nilai saya uh, tidak baik, bahkan sempat menjadi mahasiswa yang memiliki nilai akademik yang sangat memprihatinkan di bawah IPK 2 rata-ratanya. Namun, dengan dosen yang selalu memperhatikan, yang selalu mendoakan kami, dengan dosen yang selalu uh, disiplin uh, mendidik kami, saya bisa berubah. Saya bisa melihat bagaimana dengan kasih, dengan ketekunan, dan dengan disiplin para dosen mendidik anak-anak seperti saya ini agar bisa berubah, agar bisa belajar, dan dipersiapkan untuk bisa berkarir dan bisa melayani di kemudian hari. Walaupun saya mahasiswa yang satu sedang melakukan perubahan dalam hidup saya dari di bawah 2 koma, bisa naik ke 3 koma, namun kepercayaan dari dosen itu diberikan kepada saya Kepercayaan dari teman-teman mahasiswa diberikan kepada saya Dimana ketika saya tekan tempat Saya dipercayakan menjadi ketua Himpunan mahasiswa fakultas ekonomi Jadi saya, saya bisa saksikan bagaimana uh, Kasih itu ada disiplin, uh, disiplin itu ada Dan kesempatan diberikan kepada kami Untuk bisa berubah Untuk bisa belajar Prinsip-prinsip inilah yang saya pelajari di UNAI Bagaimana kita harus berdisiplin, kita harus bekerja dengan penuh uh, dedikasi. Kita sadar bahwa kita akan melakukan kesalahan. Namun dari setiap kesalahan yang kita lakukan, kita belajar, kita bangkit, dan kita bisa lebih baik lagi. Prinsip ini sangat erat dengan prinsip kita bisa berinovasi dalam pekerjaan kita. Di mana kita, ketika kita berinovasi, kita tahu kita akan melakukan kesalahan. Tapi ketika, ketika kita melakukan kesalahan, fail fast dan kita recover quicker kita mungkin akan melakukan kesalahan kesalahan itu kita lakukan dengan cepat namun kita bangkit dengan lebih cepat lagi dan semua ilmu ini semua disiplin ini saya dapat atau saya peroleh ketika saya berkuliah di UNAI setelah saya bekerja saya pun tahu ada banyak hal yang perlu saya pelajari saya memiliki latar belakang keuangan namun dunia bekerja saya lah dunia asuransi dan juga dunia teknologi dan dunia layanan tentu membutuhkan saya untuk mendedikasikan diri saya untuk berkomitmen untuk meningkatkan kemampuan saya jadi saya, saya pun melanjutkan pendidikan saya pendidikan formal atau pendidikan non formal dari mengikuti seminar-seminar seminar manajemen risiko sehingga saya memiliki gelar certified risk governance professional namun tidak cukup di sana saya menyadari bahwa Ketika saya memasuki dunia pekerjaan di perusahaan BUMN atau anak perusahaan BUMN, saya pun harus meningkatkan kemampuan komunikasi saya yang selama 20 tahun saya bekerja di perusahaan multinasional selalu berbahasa Inggris dan saya harus mempertajam kemampuan berkomunikasi saya dalam bahasa Indonesia tentunya. Jadi saya memutuskan untuk melanjutkan pendidikan saya untuk mengambil magister ilmu komunikasi di salah satu universitas di Jakarta yang memiliki program komunikasi yang sangat baik tapi saya pun melihat bahwa UNAI memiliki program Magister Manajemen saya pun mencari informasi kebetulan dari Ikatan Alumnus banyak mendorong agar kami alumnus juga kembali ke UNAI untuk belajar di UNAI sehingga tahun 2021-2022 saya kembali ke kampus untuk melanjutkan program studi saya mengikuti program Magister Manajemen dan kembali di sana saya melihat bagaimana dosen-dosen saya dulu atau dosen-dosen baru bahkan dosen-dosen senior uh, memiliki uh, disiplin mendidik uh, mendidik dengan disiplin belajar yang baik diajak berkomunikasi dan tetap juga penuh dengan kasih sayang ya dan ini menjadi uh, bekal saya untuk bisa terus berkarir saya ada satu pesan di kelas magister manajemen saya mengenai Uh, mengenai organisasi uh, dosennya uh, Prof. Marlinda Siahaan di kelas itu kami tidak boleh menggunakan kata mungkin beliau mendidik kami jangan menggunakan kata mungkin ya. berarti sebelum berkata-kata, sebelum mengutarakan pemikiran atau ide, kita sudah matangkan kita biasakan sudah matang ketika kita ucapkan, kita ucapkan dengan penuh confidence sehingga Ide itu pun bisa diterima orang lain. Disiplin yang simple, 
tidak menggunakan kata mungkin tetapi menjadi sangat berguna ketika kita bekerja di dunia profesional di mana kita perlu ide yang matang kita perlu dedikasi yang tinggi dan kita perlu juga bisa meyakinkan orang-orang di sekitar kita ya. jadi pesan saya bagi para mahasiswa adik-adik saya yang ada di UNAI ingat di sanalah kita dididik dan dibina kita akan banyak belajar dari keberhasilan dan juga dari kegagalan kita tapi ingat dosen-dosen kita di sana di rumah mereka mereka selalu mendoakan kita jadi ingat ketika anda belajar anda tahu bahwa anda akan dipersiapkan untuk masuk ke dalam dunia bekerja profesional dan bisa berhasil di sana bukan hanya bekerja tapi juga ingat harus melayani pesan berikutnya jangan tunggu anda sukses untuk anda bisa melayani Ketika Anda selesai dari UNAI, carilah tempat untuk bisa berbakti dan bisa melayani. Ingat, kita di UNAI, di disiplin untuk bisa berbakti, beribadah, jangan tinggalkan disiplin ini. Disiplin ini menjadi modal kita yang kuat untuk bisa berhasil. Jadi ingat, apa yang kita pelajari di UNAI itu akan mempersiapkan kita, adik-adik dan juga saya, untuk bisa sukses, untuk bisa berhasil, di dalam dunia pekerjaan, di dalam dunia keluarga, dan semoga kita nanti bisa bertemu di dari kerajaan surga. Itu dari saya, Yosi Wilamirot, Angkatan 97. Terima kasih Tuhan memberkati. Good morning and welcome to our webinar, international webinar entitled Managing Turbulence, Academician and Practitioner Perspective held by Universitas Advent Indonesia. My name is Valentine and I'm thrilled to be your host today. And we are joined by attendees from various universities and I would like to welcome each one of you and I am sure today's session will be over valuable insight for each one of us. After this, we are going to uh, sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, and also uh, Unai's hymn. And after that, we are going to have an opening prayer that will be held by Mr. Eddie Matanari. And then we are going to listen to the welcome remarks by our president, Mr. Dr. Milton Pardosi. And I will introduce each one of you to our moderator, Dr. Roliana Ferinia, that will uh, lead us uh, with the sixth session that we are going to listen today. Now, we are going to sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya.
opening prayer, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Eddie Matanari to lead us in prayer. Uh, we are going to invite uh, Mrs. Judith Sinaga to lead us in prayer, in opening prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Gracious God of Father, we are so blessed today. We are now going to have this international webinar. May you bless us, Lord, that we can finish this and we can be able to understand the topic or the insights that will be shared by all these guest speakers for today. We pray also that you bless all the participants, that this will not just be additional information, but this will help them, all of us, that we can understand how to manage turbulences that comes along our lives. Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit to be with us, to lead and guide us and give us uh, understanding and knowledge from above that everything that we are going to hear, everything that we are going to uh, gain today, this will help us more for our future endeavor. Whatever we do also, Lord, today, this will only for the glory and honor. Thank you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. This is Judith for the prayer. And once again, welcome to all the participants for this international webinar. Uh, don't forget to fill in the attendance list later because we are going to distribute the e-certificate according to the attendance list. And now let me introduce to you our moderator for today. Her name is Dr. Roliana Perinia. As you can see on the screen, uh, she has many things to be introduced, but I would uh, explain about her working experience and also the educational background. Uh, her bachelor degree is from Universitas Advent Indonesia uh, with a master degree as well. And she got her doctoral degree from uh, Indonesia University of Education, UP. And her working experience, she was the accounting supervisor at PT Yala uh, Perkasa International and then became the chairperson of Office Management Program, Universitas Advent Indonesia. She was also the dean of faculty of business faculty uh, of economics uh, here at Universitas Advent Indonesia. And currently, she is the lecturer in bachelor and master of program in faculty of economics here in Universitas Advent Indonesia. If you want to check her, you may uh, check on her uh, Google Scholar or maybe Scopus ID. And as you can see, she was also uh, she is also the reviewer and editor at uh, several journals. And without further ado, let me introduce you our moderator for today, um, Dr. Roliana. The time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Salentin, but actually we have to be ready for the welcome remarks from the UNI president. Am I correct or we just continue? Yes, for the welcome remarks, we are going to listen to our president, Dr. Milton Pardosi. Good morning, everyone. So on behalf of Universal of Indonesia, I would like to welcome all of you all the participants, the students, also the, our professionals who uh, joined this uh, webmaster in management Universal of Indonesia webinar with the topic managing turbulences, academicians and practitioners perspective. This is a great chance for all the students, especially as well as our lecturers at UNAI 
and all the guest speakers who have joined with this uh, webinar seminar. I really appreciate your time and even your knowledge during this seminar that you will share with all the participants who have joined this morning. And I hope there are some good insights that the students, the lecturers who join this webinar about the issue, global issue that we are facing now, turbulences. Now we have two wars. Unisoviet against Ukraine, but at the same time, Israel against Palestine. I believe there are turbulences will come to this world about uh, regarding these two wars that are happening now. And we have to be ready with these turbulences. It's almost the same with while we are in our flight. There is turbulences. What we are doing in the airplane when turbulences come. The first thing that we are doing is praying, right? <laughs> and nothing we can do in that airplane. Just pray and pray and pray. But about this issue, global issues now, it's not only praying that we can do, but we can do something to be survived, especially in the economics uh, perspective. For that reason, I really congratulate the Dean of Economic Faculty Business, as well as all the committee, even organizer of this uh, webinar. And once again, I would like to say thank you very much for all the guest speakers who have given your time for this webinar. God bless each one of you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. President, for the welcome remarks. And uh, once again, I would like to invite our moderator to lead us for the next session. Um, Dr. Roliana, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Valentine Siagian. You know, uh, she was introduce, uh, introducing me just now, so I have to introduce her also. Actually, she is a highly engaged young academic lecturer in online, very profitable with a distinguished reputation in the field of finance. So, uh, Dr. Valentine, thank yeah. you for introducing me. And also, as the participants, we are now starting the important session of the international webinar. And there will be a total of five or six speakers, Dr. Valentine. Five, am I right? Six. Oh, six. Oh, I'm sorry. Six uh, valuable speakers who will be served as a resources persons and offering their expertise and insights. So I will introduce them each session. Yeah. Uh, in every uh, session, I will introduce the speakers one by one. So without any further Waiting, I will introduce our valuable first speaker, Dr. Robin Chan. Hello, Dr. Robin Chan, where are you? Hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good, good morning for Dr. Robin Chan. He, he was an assistant professor in, from National Taipei University. So Dr. Robin Chan's academic and professional career has been marked by a financial excellence. In 2009, the individual earned a Bachelor of Management in Financial Management from Maranatha Christian University, yeah, and a PhD in Finance from UNZ University in Taiwan, where the individual worked between 2016 and 2020 cultivated this voyage. So Dr. Robin holds various professional responsibilities, including vice head of the management department in addition to his academic work. He also made uh, an important contributions to the subjects as a PhD research assistant. Robin is also vice head of the master program in management. Dr. Robbins contributes to the scholarly discourse extend beyond education. The researcher has published in prestigious academic journals like a review of quantitative finance and accounting and journal of business finance and accounting. 
Dr. Robin, uh, an experienced presenter in a lot of conferences, has presented at important international conferences, exhibiting his commitment to the knowledge and the scholar conversation. So Dr. Robin, we are delighted to extend our warm welcome and the Zoom is yours. Feel free to share your insights and expertise with the audience. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, this is my uh, honor to uh, join this uh, conference. So uh, I would like to say uh, thank you for uh, this uh, opportunity for me to sharing uh, uh, my knowledge uh, for uh, all of you. Okay, so uh, let me uh, share my screen first. Okay, how about the screen? Is this clear? Okay, clear, very clear. Okay, okay, so I will start. And uh, today my topic is about the turbulence in the university education in the Taiwan. And we can take a look for the challenges and the uh, prospect for the education in Taiwan. Okay, so we can take a look first for the QS ranking. Okay, few months ago, we can take a look the top 20 uh, universities uh, most come from the uh, European country. And one uh, is come from the uh, China. And if we compare to the THE uh, ranking in the 2024, we can take a look for the top 20. They are include the two uh, university from the China. Okay, and most of uh, the rest uh, university is come from the uh, Europeans and come from the uh, United States. So we can take a look uh, if we compare the QS ranking and the TSE uh, e ranking in the 2024, we can take a look from the developed and the developing countries. For example, in the QS ranking, we can take a look the 19, uh, the top 19 uh, universities is come from the developed countries and one university is come from the developing countries. Okay, it's mean uh, the China. And if we compare the TSE ranking for the top 20, we can take a look the 18 is come from the developed countries and two is come from the developing uh, countries. And also uh, two of the country is, uh, two of the university is come from the China. Okay, so we can take a look at the difference uh, between the developed and the uh, developing countries for their uh, education system. And we can see the education is the key okay, for the higher education, how we can uh, make a development. Okay, so uh, from the higher education, we can make a development through to the investment. So what kind of the investment that uh, we can do in the higher, in the higher education to uh, pursue for the development? For example, we can do the investment for the teaching. Okay, we know in the higher education, the main uh, job is for the uh, teaching. And besides for the teaching, uh, most of the investment is come from the R&D or we call it a uh, research. Okay, so uh, no matter if you are the undergraduate students or you are the master student or even you are the PhD students, yeah, we will uh, take a research. Okay, so this is a uh, two more uh, important uh, investment in the higher education. So we can take a look from the developing uh, countries. In the developing countries, uh, we need to have a uh, more investment in the higher in the higher education. Because when we have a more investment in the higher education, the teaching, the research that we can achieve for the competitive in the global. So nowadays, uh, we are not only talking about the uh, local or uh, religion, or sorry, or the region, but now we will talking about the competitive in the global market. So when we can receive the competitive in the global uh, market, it will be uh, transforming to the national uh, economic performance. So let's take a look for the Taiwan. Okay, so this is a map for the Taiwan, and this is the flag for the Taiwan. The capital city is uh, on the Taipei. Okay, so it's a uh, north part uh, in the Taiwan. As you can see, the uh, the building, the famous building, is the uh, Taipei One Zero One. 
And this is a uh, separate information about the Taiwan. Like we can see, uh, in Taiwan is a very unique. Okay, so sometimes we will call this is a Taiwan. Sometimes we will call this is a Zhonghua Mingguo, or sometimes even we will call it a Chinese Taipei. Okay, so if you are searching in the Google, you can find the name of the Taiwan is a different. Okay, so we can call Zhonghua Mingguo, we can call Chinese Taipei, or even we can call it a Taiwan. And for the national language, uh, mostly uh, in the Taiwan, we will use the standard Chinese or we will use the uh, Mandarin. But uh, beside the uh, main language, we also have the uh, local language like the Hokkien, like the Hakka, and also uh, the other uh, local language. And for the religion, uh, based on the data for the 2020, we can take a look uh, mostly in the Taiwan, the percentage is the, the highest one is the uh, Buddhism, okay, around the 35.1%. Uh, and we can take a look for the Christianity is the only take for the 3.9% in the total uh, population in the Taiwan. Okay, so we can see the Taiwan is a very uh, small uh, portion for the uh, Christianity. Okay, so we can take a look for the uh, economics in the Taiwan. Okay, so this is I take from the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs. We can take a look from the World Trade uh, Organization. The Taiwan was the 16th uh, largest uh, exported and the 17th uh, largest uh, important in the 2021. Okay, so we can take a look the Taiwan gross domestic domestic uh, product. It will be a uh, reach around the 33,000 uh, US dollar in the 2021. And the other uh, economic uh, data, we can take a look. Uh, the PPP per uh, capita is the 59,300 US dollar. And for the GDP, we can take a look. Uh, mostly is the 60%, 60.57% is uh, contribute from the services industry. And the 38% is come from the industry. And the 1.48% is come from the uh, agriculture. Okay, so... Uh, Nowadays, we can see the portion for the agriculture is a very uh, low, but uh, in the history, the agriculture uh, make a more uh, contribution for the GDP in Taiwan. And we can see the economic growth in the Taiwan is also a uh, very good. Okay, so from the 2015 until the 2021, we can see the economic growth from the 1.47 uh, up to the 6.57. Uh, percent for the economic growth rates. And we can see from the trade and the investment the profile for the 2021, the total export is the 446 billion US dollar and the import is the 381 billion. So we can see the trade balance is a positive or is a surplus for the 65.3 billion. Okay, and this is the registered outward investment and the registered inward uh, investment. So uh, based on the economic uh, data, we can see that the economic performance in Taiwan is uh, growing up. Okay, we can take a look from the global uh, survey ranking. Okay, most of the uh, survey uh, mentioned that the Taiwan have a good uh, performance. Okay, for example, in the World uh, Competitive uh, Yearbooks, in the Profit uh, Opportunity Recommendation, the Index of the Economic uh, Freedoms, and uh, the other survey. We can see uh, the performance of uh, economics in Taiwan is uh, very good. Okay, So we don't have uh, any problem uh, for the economics in the Taiwan. But we can take a look how about the populations by the country in the 2023. We can uh, see this is a top 10 of the uh, population in the world. Okay, We can compare from the 2022 to the 2023. And we know that uh, in the 20, before the 2023, it's been uh, uh, 2022, most of the people is, uh, the most population is come from the China. But uh, starting from the 2023, the, uh, the most population in the world is uh, become the India. Okay, so this is the top 10 of the population. And we can see that Indonesia is the ranking four. Okay, so we have uh, so many uh, populations, okay, we are still uh, the ranking four. How about the Taiwan? Okay, we can take a look. The Taiwan they only have a uh, twenty uh, around the twenty four million. Okay, around the twenty four million uh, people. Okay, based on the data in the twenty twenty three. 
So if we compare the Taiwan and the Indonesia, okay, if we compare the Taiwan and the Indonesia, we can see the portion uh, only is the 8.6% of the population in the Indonesia. So uh, actually Taiwan is a very uh, small uh, country. Okay, and the number of the population is quite uh, low compared to the Indonesia. It's been less than the 10% from the Indonesia. And we can see the total population in, of the Taiwan from the 1990 to the 2022. Starting from 1990 until the 2018, uh, we can see the number of the population in Taiwan is still uh, growing up. Okay, from the 20 million to the 23.5 million. However, we can see since the 2018 until uh, now, and they will predict until the 2030, the number of the population, it will be uh, decreased. And this is uh, become one of the issue uh, in the Taiwan. And we can see the education system in the Taiwan. Actually, in the Taiwan, the education system is quite uh, similar uh, with the Indonesia. It means that uh, for the every student at least, uh, they need to have a 12 years uh, basic education system. Okay, so, and if we compare to the Indonesia, we know that uh, in, the, in the Indonesia, we have so uh, many universities, so many uh, colleges, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, more than the 4,500. Okay, but in the Taiwan, because this is a very a small country, so in the Taiwan, actually, we only have the 149 uh, universities. Okay, so include the university colleges and the junior uh, colleges. So in the total, we only have the 149. Okay, so we can take a look what is the challenges uh, in the education in Taiwan. Okay, the first is the how the bilingual uh, 2030 policy will boost the Taiwan global uh, competitiveness. So nowadays, uh, we know that the, uh, the main language in the global is the English. Okay, even uh, sometimes people will say uh, Chinese and uh, English, uh, it, it will be the uh, language for the global competitiveness. But uh, we still believe that the English is still uh, become the more uh, important uh, communication for the global uh, competitiveness. And we can see uh, the government in Taiwan, especially for the uh, Ministry of Education, they have the target for the bilingual for the 2030 uh, policy. Okay, so we can see the main goal for the bilingual uh, 2030 policy is to attract the international investment. Okay, so even we know the economics in Taiwan is uh, still uh, growing up, but uh, for, the for the governments, they will still uh, try to attract the international investment. And they also want to increase the foreign uh, professional living and the working in Taiwan. So Nowadays, we can see uh, many of the uh, foreign students when they come to the Taiwan and finish their uh, education. Yeah, some of the uh, foreigners, they will uh, choose to uh, stay in the Taiwan and find a job in the Taiwan. Okay, so this is the main uh, bilingual uh, 2030 policy. And another issue is we can, uh, another challenge is we can take a look at the news that uh, from the Ministry of uh, Education in Taiwan, the enrollment at the Taiwanese University to dip below the 900,000. So we can take a look at uh, the historical data. Okay, from the 2016, for the MOE data, they have uh, 241,000 uh, students uh, entering the college and the university. Okay, but uh, nowadays until the 2023, it's a drop to the 191,000. Okay, so the Ministry of uh, Education uh, worry about the education in the Taiwan because uh, nowadays uh, the population is a uh, decrease. Okay, so the number of the students uh, enter to the Taiwanese university is also a uh, decreases. Okay, so we can take a look. The MOE mentioned that the, from the 2023 to the 2028, the drop it will be around the 40,000 uh, 40, uh, students, okay, or around the 1.6% uh, per year. Okay, so we can see in Taiwan now is a very uh, Taiwan face uh, crisis. They will lose the local, uh, local Taiwanese uh, students. Okay, so they need to find uh, more students. And one of the uh, opportunity is to invite the international students. 
Okay, so we can take a look, uh, especially for the business school in uh, Taiwan. And uh, for the business school, I think uh, all of us uh, recognize uh, with the AACSB uh, accreditations. And in Taiwan, uh, from the 149 uh, universities, we have uh, 30 universities uh, in Taiwan that uh, achieve the AACSB uh, accreditation. And we can take a look at uh, how we're addressing the key uh, challenges. For the bilingual uh, 2030 policies, okay, we can take a look at uh, how is the state of the policy include. For example, the high school and the college, uh, they need to improve the English uh, proficiency. And nowadays, uh, we will uh, follow the, the age. Uh, we will using the digital uh, teaching environments. And we also provide the international certified uh, English uh, proficiency test. I think uh, this is also uh, uh, happening in the Indonesia University. Nowadays, uh, many of the uh, undergraduate students or the master uh, students, before they uh, graduate, they should have the international certified uh, English proficiency test. And not only for the students, for the civil uh, servants, they also need to improve the English uh, proficiency. So nowadays in Taiwan, uh, in the many of the civil uh, servants, yeah, you may speak uh, English because they have the uh, ability to speak the English uh, proficiency. And Taiwan also uh, established uh, for the bilingual policy development center, and they would like to optimize the bilingual condition for the young uh, students. So we can take a look like uh, in the Taipei Metro, it's a metro in the Taipei city. They are not only uh, talking in the Chinese, not only in the English, but they also include the Korean and the Japanese language for the 21 station. And many of the uh, park, they also uh, provide the uh, bilingual language, for example, the Chinese and the English. And for the hospital, they also provide the international medical center. So if you face uh, some problem, go to see the doctor. Yeah, you cannot speak the Chinese and you can use the English for the communication. And for the National Immigration Agency, of course, uh, they will have uh, ability to communicate with the English okay? because many of the uh, workers come from uh, the different uh, countries. And even in the road, Okay, even uh, we know that we cannot read the Chinese, but uh, we still can survive in the Taiwan because uh, nowadays in the road, they will mention in the bilingual, in Chinese and also in English. Even we go to the uh, traditional uh, market or we eat the breakfast, yeah, we also can find the menu they provide the English. Okay, so uh, nowadays in Taiwan, it's a very uh, convenient uh, to use the English for the communication. Okay, so if you don't, uh, if you don't, uh, if you cannot speak the Chinese, it still can uh, survive in the Taiwan. Okay, so uh, not only for the uh, daily life, but uh, for the higher education, they also, uh, most of the universities, they provide the bilingual education office. And uh, they also establish for the international uh, college. And we can take a look, the Ministry of the Education, they invest the 424 million NT dollar for the bilingual uh, education. Okay, so the Ministry of uh, Education, they try to uh, use the funding for, uh, distribute the funding to the university to implement the bilingual uh, education. Okay, and we will use the, we call is the English as a medium of uh, instruction uh, courses, or we call is the EMI. So nowadays in Taiwan, uh, most of the university, they will provide the EMI course, okay? no matter it's the undergraduate, master, or the PhD program. Okay, so we can uh, compare to the uh, Korean or we can compare to the uh, Japanese. They, they don't have uh, so many uh, English courses uh, compared to the Taiwan uh, universities. And another uh, addressing the key challenges is the number of the student enrollments because we know that the population in Taiwan uh, nowadays is uh, decreasing. So the number of the student, it will be also uh, decreasing. So one of the uh, problem, uh, one of the solution is that Taiwan will seeking the 10,000 more uh, overseas students over the next four years. So this is a good uh, opportunity for the foreign student, especially for the Indonesia student, uh, come to Taiwan to take a uh, a uh, bachelor degree or to the master degree or even the PhD uh, programs. Okay, in the 2018, we can take a look. The foreign student in Taiwan is a 10% of the total university and the college students. Okay, so uh, during the 2018, 10% uh, of the student is come from the uh, foreign students in Taiwan.
Okay, so we can see uh, this is a uh, one of the way to uh, remove the crisis for the population. Excuse me, Dr. Chan. Yeah. Uh, three minutes remaining. Okay. Okay, I will Thank be more uh, faster. Okay, so we can take a look at the number of students uh, study in Taiwan from the 2012 to the 2022. We can see uh, actually the number is uh, increasing, but uh, 2020 we know is a pandemic and uh, Taiwan closed the board, so uh, foreign students cannot come to the Taiwan. And we can take a look at a few motivations uh, why uh, the foreign students co uh, come to the Taiwan for the studying, like the friendly and the welcome culture, good academic quality and the reputation. And uh, what, why the uh, primary considerations, okay, for example, the reputations and the character of the institution. And uh, what is the uh, challenges studying in the Taiwan? Mostly it's the uh, loneliness and the uh, isolation because uh, sometimes if you cannot speak uh, Chinese, yeah, it will be more uh, difficult. But we can see in Taiwan, uh, many of the universities, they will provide the uh, Chinese language uh, training. Okay, so uh, we can see uh, this is the uh, some of the survey. Uh, when do you plan to stay in the Taiwan to work uh, after the graduation? So we can take a look that uh, mostly of the uh, survey they mentioned that uh, after they graduate, if they have the opportunity uh, to study uh, to working in the Taiwan, yeah, they will uh, choose to uh, living and uh, working in the Taiwan. Okay, so we know that uh, one of the problem, uh, one of the facing problem for the uh, student is uh, if you want to go to study abroad, uh, you need to find the scholarship. Okay, so we can see uh, many of the universities, they will provide the uh, international uh, scholarship for the uh, students. Okay, so uh, most of the campus, they will provide the internal scholarship, or you can find some of the scholarship from the governments, like the Ministry of Education, or you can find from the Ministry of the Foreign uh, Affairs, or from uh, the other uh, corporation. Okay, they will provide some of the scholarship for the international students. Okay, so for the conclusion, we can take a look. The Taiwan issue uh, mostly is uh, related to the population declines and the difficulties in the internationalization. And for the education uh, turbulence, we can see the bilingual uh, 2030 policies and the local and the foreign student enrollment and how we can achieve the global uh, competitive by the investing in the education and provide the international uh, environment. Okay, so uh, the Aristoteles mentioned the roots of the education are bitter, but the fruit is the sweet. Okay, so uh, welcome to the Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robin Chan. A very interesting, and I will conclude a little bit. It appears that Taiwan, Taiwanese institutions are experiencing disruptions, so they have to prepare a very well competitive uh, activity such as bilingual policy and providing international scholarship. So everyone here, want to continue your study to Taiwan, Dr. Robin Chan will prepare a path for you. Am I right, Dr. Chan? Yes, <laughs> yes. So uh, for you the are. student, if you are interested to uh, come to the Taiwan and you need to uh, consulting, yeah, you can uh, contact me, it's okay. Yeah. Wow, great. Thank you very much. I will be the one to enroll there. <laughs> okay. Uh, before proceeding to the following session, maybe uh, we can take photo shot, Valentin, uh, Dr. Valentin. Yeah, maybe because there, uh, there are two speakers. Uh, we'll leave the Zoom after this uh, for some reason. So we will take a picture. Maybe uh, Dr. Valentin will take the shoot. And please show your handsome and beautiful face. It means that you have to open your, uh, what what is that camera? And so we can take the picture. Okay. okay, so let's take a picture together. Uh, Peter, can you help us uh, also with the screenshot? Okay. So please open all your uh, videos so that we can see each one of you. Okay, give your best smile. I will take the first screen. One, two, three. 
And for the second um, screen, one, two, three. And then for the third screen, please be patient. <laughs> one, two, three. And for the fourth screen, one, two, three. And also for the uh, last screen. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for your uh, best smile. So I will give back to uh, Dr. Roliana as our moderator. Thank you. Now let us proceed to the next speaker. Maligayang uh, pagdating kay Mrs. Christine. So nice to meet you here in the Zoom. I will introduce you a brief short CP. Mrs. Christina Ko Orbeta is a vibrant force of 70 years old. Is a Filipino brilliance and expertise lady. She was an independent director. And since January 2020, she served as a visionary chair of the Corporate Governance and Compliance Committee and brings her insights to the risk management and audit committees. Beyond her directorial role, Mrs. Christina is a strategic consultant for the World Bank, where her wisdom shapes global perspectives. Her illustrious past includes advisory roles and board memberships at UCPB and UCPB Saving Banks and UCPB Leasing, showcasing her financial acumen. Christina's, Mrs. Christina's journey encompasses leadership as deputy general manager at Manila Offshore Branch and prestigious position at PDIC, including president or vice chairperson at executive vice president. Her academic odyssey adorned with a Bachelor of Art in Mathematics from the University of the East and Master's Degree in the Economic and Public Administration from the same institution and also from Harvard University. Respectively reveals the depth of her intellectual progress. Mrs. Christina stands as a beacon of wisdom and seamlessness blending national pride with a global impact. A hard welcome to Mrs. Christina, who's present as immense value to our event. So, ma'am, the time is yours. Hello, ma'am. Okay. Oh, hey, thank you. Thank you so much. I am trying to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, but an email, email, in email position. Not yet the presentation uh or point. I think that yeah, you can okay. That's good, Mrs. Uh, yeah. Where is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. You may continue. I'm very pleased to be uh, joining you in this forum to discuss a very relevant topic that has confronted us all the time. I'm sure you have heard about Silicon Valley Bank and other banks in the U.S., which were hit by liquidity and asset quality issues, which led to their closure. And in our midst now are events unfolding in China's big financial institutions following the problems in the real estate sector. In Asia, we have our own share of the problems as there are some banks and financial institutions that are still reeling from the impact of the pandemic and the overall slowdown in their economies. <clears throat> so what is a turbulence? I consider any dis disturbance with negative repercussions as a turbulence. A turbulence can happen suddenly or it can start quietly. So a sudden turbulence can take the form of a typhoon, earthquake, tsunami, volcanic eruption. They're uncontrollable and catches us uh, unprepared and we should nevertheless be prepared to handle these situations 
with appropriate resources and backup arrangements. On the other hand, other forms of turbulence starts quietly and slowly with few or no signals at all and evolves to be a bigger crisis. And examples are financial crisis, financial system problems, which may, due, may be due to excessive risk taking or loss of confidence or mismanagement or economic downturns. Prudential regulations, good governance, monitoring and surveillance will help identify and address problems early on. So uh, turbulence can lead to a crisis if it is not promptly addressed. Wikipedia defines it's a very simple and easy to understand definition when it says that crisis is an event that is going or is expected to lead to an unstable and dangerous situation which affects a group, individual, or even a whole society. A crisis situation involves intense difficulty or danger and requires critical decisions to be made. Usually you never know when it is going to happen and the extent of its negative consequences. So the impact of a crisis can be reduced with adequate preparation. Crisis management involves the ability to respond and uh, promptly take action whenever there is a problem and uh, postponing this. <clears throat> and um, usually, sorry. And usually um, it involves uh, certain things of uh, decisions to be made because it is sudden, it is significant and unpredictable. But there are ways to avoid a crisis situation, especially in the financial world. So let's focus on a financial crisis. This table gives you a flavor of the circumstances that can give rise to a crisis and how it can be addressed. So um, non-compliance with potential regulations, excessive risk taking and dealing with unregulated institutions, outright violation of laws and regulations to, to make money, too aggressive business strategy, and in most cases, refusing to admit that there is a problem and postponing decisions, hoping that markets will turn around can spark a crisis situation. Further, complications from cyber crimes, mail violence, or, or computer hacking can destroy the business. And so with rapid spread of communications, can also ruin the reputation of individuals and entities that are managing a uh, financial entity. So um, developments. <clears throat> so for most of these problems, good governance plus prudential business strat strategy are key contributors to avoiding a crisis. <clears throat> So what could lead to a financial crisis? Developments in local and global settings affect day-to-day -day decisions of banks and financial institutions, where to invest, where to lend, how much funds to allocate for each in investment instruments, at what interest rates and exchange rates, and at what maturity depend on one's perception of how these var variables will move. Frequently, short-term profitability is prioritized hoping that there would be a turnaround in interest rates or exchange rates. And refusal to face the problem delays important decisions to be taken and can lead to a serious crisis situation, sometimes even the closure of a bank or financial institution. So the events leading to the closure of Silicon Valley was precipitated by the sharp drop in interest rates that significantly reduced the value of its assets which were invested mostly in government securities since lending and investments in other economic sectors has slowed down drastically during the pandemic. With assets short to pay for its liabilities and with insufficient liquidity, it attempted to raise capital, but this exacerbated the situation since other depositors started withdrawing their money when they realized that the bank was in trouble. Some other banks followed suit. We can expect that all banks have been hit 
and suffered from mark to market and even actual losses, but in different degrees. And they've been able to absorb the losses because they have a capital buffer and a more diversified asset portfolio. So what do regulators do to maintain financial stability? <clears throat> you will note that, that the regulators issue a lot of uh, regulations, <clears throat> prudential regulations to guide, to guide our um, <clears throat> banks and financial institutions on how to conduct the business. <clears throat> So, um, but uh, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of um, um, decision to be made by banks and financial institutions because they have a to balance between profit and following the rules. So coordination among financial safety net players via the Financial Stability Council is being strengthened. So with monitoring and surveillance of developments. The deposit insurance system has also been strengthened to help maintain financial stability by assuring depositors that their deposits are insured. Likewise, regulators also have early intervention and prompt corrective action measures that may be tapped to help banks and financial institutions that are in distress. So these are the means by which regulators have been trying to avoid financial system crisis. So crisis management involves preparation for what should be done even before a crisis, what should be done when a crisis hits, and what should be done after. So you will note that preparedness is key to averting and minimizing the impact of a crisis. <clears throat> Pre-crisis preparations involve putting the institution's house in order. If you are a bank or financial institution, you have to formulate your own policies and uh, procedures, comply with laws and regulations in accordance with the prudential measures that have been issued by the regulator. <clears throat> it requires a lot of vigilance in continuing, continuously assessing the institution's financial situation and the impact of the strategies it has taken. <clears throat> So it has to simulate based on expectations of interest rate and foreign exchange developments. It also requires a careful analysis of concentration of risk, liquidity funding gaps, credit, credit and <clears throat> investment losses and recoverability, and the buffers to avoid losses. Good governance underpins the honest and efficient implementation of regulations and also ensures its sustainability. <clears throat> so during a crisis, the objective is to be able to handle the crisis and see to its quick resolution. The sooner the institution admits that the house is on fire and needs help rescue if warranted may be forthcoming. As you can see in this slide, both the regulator and the institution concerned have roles to play during a crisis situation. In addition to institution specific measures, the regulator may issue regulatory reliefs in terms of booking of losses, past due accounts, etc. When the impact of developments are system wide, as most of the regulators did during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also at this disposal are early intervention and prompt corrective action measures for institutions that are in distress. These measures are taken provided the institution is still viable. If not, the most plausible resolution could be the closure of the institution. And this uh, happens a lot of times because at the end of the day, the um, bank or financial institutions no longer viable. So the regulators have no al alternative other than to close the institution. And that is where the deposit insurer comes to the rescue 
to save the depositors to the extent of their insured deposits. So closure happens because the call for help did not happen soon enough or the regulator has not been able to spot the problem because the institution is not fully disclosing its true financial position. So, so as you can see, um, there are a lot of uh, responsibilities as far as the institution is concerned and they cannot forever hide what is uh, their true financial position from the regulator. I would like to imagine that FDIC, what FDIC did when Silicon Valley, which is the 16th largest bank in the US, was in the midst of, the bank, of a bank run. Most of the depositors are big depositors, and so their deposits were way in excess of the maximum insured by FDIC. So it is expected that they will all rush to withdraw their deposits. The bank was shut by FDIC in March 2023, and note that FDIC was quick to assure depositors that they will commence the payment of insurance immediately, pursuing its mandate as deposit insurer. And then subsequently, because of the profile of the depositors, regulators even announced that they will pay in full all the deposits not insured by FDIC to come the market, because all deposit insurers have a maximum uh, coverage for all depositors. So it is um, it varies by by country to country, and uh, this is the maximum amount that any deposit insurer will pay to a depositor. So any amount in excess of that is um, payable by the bank out of its assets. And so uh, knowing that uh, the financial institution that closes has a significantly impaired asset and liability position, then the probability of recovery as well as the time within which you can expect to recover is, is quite uncertain. So um, uh, as resolution authority, um, regulators then announced that they will pay in full all the deposits to uh, prevent a crisis situation. And um, <clears throat> because FDIC is also what they call the resolution authority for the US, it was able to immediately sell all deposits and loans of Silicon Valley Bank to First Citizens Bank. And this provided relief to depositors and creditors of the closed bank. But note that not all um, deposit insurers can act with speed and with authority as FDIC. Uh, for a lot of uh, countries, the um, ability to resolve a bank takes time because of a lot of um, uh, laws and regulations to comply with. So given its objective, it's important for a deposit insurer to be prepared for any eventuality. It should identify what circumstances could give rise to a disruption in a payout process because as after having announced that they will pay, the process of payout is also even a very challenging process. What other risks could a deposit insurer face that could disrupt its payout operation? A depositor running amok because he lost his lifetime savings, money intended for payout is short, and there is a pandemic, and there is a need to finish processing and validating the deposits to prepare for payout. So it may be difficult to identify all possible circumstances and prepare to address each of these risk events, but there are certainly standard procedures and policies that can be adopted, measures that can be taken, and infrastructure that can be set up to address problems even before they occur. Being prepared to face these problems is very important for a deposit insurer to enable it to service depositors with minimum delay and perform its mandate to maintain financial stability. Both the regulator and the depositor, deposit insurer rather, have mandates to maintain financial stability and should thus work closely together to achieve this objective. I am open for questions if uh, you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay, let, let us see the chat room. Is there any question to be asked? Or participant, if you have a question, just write down and I will read the question for Mrs. Christine. We have still two minutes uh, to go. 
So we are waiting for the question or it's clear, very clear, the explanation uh, given by Mrs. Christine. Ma'am, it's clear enough, very clear. Thank you. The question. And then maybe I will, I will, uh, I will uh, tell you if there is a question in the chat room. Okay, I will conclude. Thank you, uh, first of all, for the clear explanation regarding how to manage turbulences in the financial statement. So the conclusion is the, diversi the diversified approach is needed to address financial system uh, volatility, regulation reform, risk management, and financial transparency are essential. With comply with the laws and regulations, monitoring compliance, cyber security measure, vigilance, improve customer service, communication and marketing strategy, good human resources management, and good governance and robust risk management system. Thank you, Mrs. Christine, for your time, your valuable time for us. Okay. Uh, now, I think we have to proceed to the other, uh, to another speaker. I know the time is very fast and uh, a little bit rust in presenting the material, but we got the point from the material. So, Dr. Benny Budiawan Chandrasan, how are you? Are you there already? Hello, Miss. Uh, ah, Dr. I'm doing Liana. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your present. <laughs> Okay, I will introduce you, uh, Dr. Benny. Dr. Benny is an associate professor with a distinguished academic background and notable achievements. He was born in May 31, 31 1971, uh, 72 in Garut. Dr. Chandra San of the, or Dr. Budi is exemplar of academic dedication, holds a doctoral degree from Pajajaran University, Bandung, with an impressive GPA of 3.34. His research expertise lies in the intrinsic, uh, intricate dynamics of financial markets, particularly focused on variables that influence expected excess return in LK45 stock portfolio. Dr. Chandrasan earned a, a Master of Management degree from Institute Technology Bandung and also his foundation in Bachelor in Parahyangan Catholic University majoring in management. Dr. Chandrasa is a prolific academic with a significant impact economic and financial research. So he has a lot of research, uh, including consumer confidence index, GDP growth models, and factors influencing earnings management. His work reflects a deep engagement with the contemporary economic and financial issues, showcase of prestigious journals and conferences. So, Mrs. Uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chandrasa, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Miss, Miss Dr. Oliana, for the introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, to maintain the time duration, sound, and video quality, I have recorded my presentation. So I allow the committee to play my video. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Benny Budion Chandrasa. I'm a lecturer in Maranatha Christian University, Bandung. On this occasion, let me present a merger of my two research, which form the title Mission Future Happiness. I choose that title because actually the deepest desire of every human being is to achieve happiness in the present 
and the features. Some people consider feature as a risk. Once Steve Jobs has said that death is very likely the single best invention of life. It is life change agent. It cleans out the old to make way for the new. And some people consider future as an uncertainty and scary. And what do people really wish for in the future? <clears throat> it is said that happiness is feeling excited for the future. From my newest research, I found that although in general gross national product is still the main target of the nations, there is an ideal that a happy population is the new goal that deserves to be a goal. It's taken from Esmail and Silly 2018. One country in Asia, in Bhutan, has applied this by stating that happiness is more important than gross national product. For this reason, Bhutan sets the gross national happiness, or GNH index, as a benchmark for the country's development. <clears throat> It is taken from Adler et al. 2017. A new study from the University of Warwick found that companies that focus on paying attention to the happiness of their workers have other beneficial impacts. That's because workers' happiness will increase their productivity. To support this process, a happy state of mind is very beneficial. Engelman, 2018. And United Nations has also declared March 20 as the International Day of Happiness. And once every two years, the World Happiness Report is important. My newest uh, article that has been uh, uploaded in journal entitled Determinan Baru Untuk Mengukur Indeks Kebahagiaan Dunia Guna Mendukung Keberlanjutan Produktivitas Kerja or in English, <clears throat> new determinants for measuring the world's happiness index to support sustainability, sustainable work productivity. This study was conducted to look for other internationally known determinants that have a significant influence on the happiness index apart from the six indicators that have been used in making the World Happiness Report. <clears throat> and some factors that I have found uh, that must be managed to create happiness is or are inflation rate, control of corruption, unemployment rate that will influence world happiness index. Meanwhile, for my former research, which uh, titled Determinants of Consumer Confidence Index to predict 
the economy in Indonesia is uh, published in Austral Asian Accounting Business and Finance Journal found that the model of consumer confidence index consists of four independence variable with three of them similar to the independence variable uh, that influence world happiness index except foreign exchange rate this is the, the model <coughs> So, the merge of both equations, it's CCI or Consumer Confidence Index, it can be read as, or it can be interpreted as several factors that influence confidence are foreign exchange, unemployment, control of corruption, and inflation rate. And the independent variable that influence what happiness index it can be interpreted as happiness is influenced by controlled inflation rate as well as low level of corruption and unemployment and become the, uh, to form the new equation which can be interpreted happiness plus a strong domestic currency exchange rate makes people confident Some artists and uh, people also agree with those of two components. Brian Tracy said that happiness and self-confidence come naturally when you feel yourself moving and progressive toward becoming the very best person you can possibly be. And <clears throat> the famous artist Taylor Swift said that happiness and confidence are the prettiest things you can wear. So, how to survive from future turbulence My answer is be happy and confident. The suggestion to be happy and confident are first to control inflation rate. How? Make an investment. Make a good investment. <clears throat> Second, avoid corruption. Do not bribe. Avoid being blackmailed. Understand and use the law to protect your right. Third, be productive. Avoid unemployed. Avoid unemployment. Get more knowledge. For example, take a higher education or some certified course. Fourth, maintain your value of assets using portfolio investment management. I believe that one can be confident to face the future if they succeed 
to, hand, to handle those things. Marcus Aurelius once said that the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thought. That's all my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chandra uh, Sal. Is there any explanation you want to add? Not yet, ma'am. Okay, yeah, I, I wait for the question. The question. Okay. Thank you. Participant, don't forget, uh, take your keyboard and chat uh, about the question. Uh, if there are any, I, I, I hope or I do hope there is, this is interesting uh, explanation about your own research. Am I right, Dr. Benny? Your own research yes, about, yes. wait, 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 I will, I will take, uh, I will read the, yeah, happiness index to support sustainability with productivity. So this is very interesting research. I hope everybody uh, heard the explanation. Okay, while waiting for the questions, uh, I will conclude uh, your presentation. So the happiness index boosts productivity and sustainability yes. from the result of your uh, research. Happy, satisfied workers are more productive, cooperative, engaged, according to the research. So organizational, or, or sorry, organizations must prioritize happiness index initiatives as they realize the link between employee well-being and productivity. Very interesting, doctor. I hope you you text me to join the research for the Thank next you, future I research. Also <laughs> wait for, for very the, interesting. Uh, I like it very much. Okay. Uh, while waiting, maybe to short uh, to shorten our time uh, if there is a question in the chat room uh, if you uh, don't mind please answer the question in everybody i mean so everybody will see don't chat in japri if in indonesia yeah don't chat personally uh, but uh, but to the general chat room so we will read the answer thank you for the very very great insight okay uh, now we will continue to the next uh, presenter, very young man, I think. I know him very well, Yossi Irod. It is with a great pleasure that we all welcome Mrs. Uh, Miss Yossi Irod to the stage. I will introduce him. Yossi William Irod, CRGP, is an, an is an insurance expert in change management and technology. He is an experienced expert in this sector. Since March 2020, PT Asuransi BRI Life have employed him as a director of operations. They oversee product development technology and the writing service claims healthcare and a Shari unit. And also from October 20, uh, 2017 until March 2021, Mrs. Yos Mr. Mr. Yossi was a director and a con country chief technology and transformation officer in AXA service in Indonesia. He oversaw national technology project and transformation project, data analy analytics, security, and operational risk silence were his executive duties. Yossi was the director of transformation at PT Asuransi Jiwa Manulai before, yeah, from October 2013 until October 2017. Yossi is pursuing a management, magister management 
and also Magister Ilmu Komunikasi at Universitas Advent Indonesia and Pasca Sarjana Universitas Sakit Jakarta respectively. He graduated from Universitas Advent Indonesia with a Bachelor in Accounting in 2002. Business technologist and change management expert Yossi William Ewart is well known. Certification as a certified risk governance professional is also his. The person's expertise in crisis management, data analytics, and information security management shows they can navigate the insurance industry's ever-changing landscape. So, Mr. Mr. Ayrod, we will appreciate your presence, and now the time is yours. Thank you, Ma'am Rolin. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for the time given to me to share my experience and view as practitioner of the topic on turbulent time or managing turbulences. Since my background, I have always been within the financial industry and more specifically in insurance industry, both uh, life insurance and general insurance or property and casualty. So, I'll be sharing more on the perspective of financial industry, uh, professional uh, perspective. You will find later my materials echoes what Mom Christine uh, or Roberta shared about what needs to be done in managing turbulent time, especially for financial industries. Uh, this is just the outline of what I will be covering. Nevertheless, I will be just focusing on the experience and perspective as other topics may have already been covered and will be covered by other speakers. You know, as uh, Dr. Paradusi said, you know, when we talk about turbulent time, what comes to mind is a picture of an airplane. Those who frequently travel have certain experienced flights where there were turbulences. Uh, usually, turbulences are anticipated or identified through the use of technology or whether technology on board the airplane is lay, uh, itself or from the ground control monitoring, where information about potential or possible turbulences are provided to the pilots to be prepared, either to take an alternative course of action or be prepared heading into the turbulences itself. The cause, uh, of course, can vary from just wind, storm. Uh, the turbulences can be headwinds, tailwinds, sidewinds, or just heavy clouds. And of course, it will require skills obtained through the pilot's training and hours and hours of experience to be able to navigate through the turbulences. Now, the financial market or the financial industry also have turbulences similar to what the turbulences in the air are. You know, uh, Financial market also face turbulences. Uh, the situations are usually explained using acronyms. Most of you may be familiar with these acronyms. There is uh, turbulences that we call VUCA, uh, R-U-P-T. Uh, there are also BANI, B-A-N-I, or even TUNA. Uh, people may have see a different acronyms revolving around the same words, such as turbulences, uncertainty, ambiguity, volatility, and so on. And all of this situation, this points to a challenging time. As I explained earlier, I will be sharing the perspective of financial industry. So uh, let's go into what the Indonesian financial industry or Indonesian insurance industry have experienced in the past few years. You know, not limited to the life insurance industry or financial industry, everyone, everyone went through the pandemic period. Pandemic tested our resilience as human being, our resilience as society, and yes, our resilience as industry. Indonesia economic, Indonesia resilience were tested. As you can see from the graph on the right-hand side, in 2020, our economy were impacted. And because of our resilience, we got up, we recovered, and then we forecast and we foresee a more positive growth in the time to come to the level, to the level before the pandemic was here. Of course, there are, pandemic, uh, there are companies which are resilient and made it through. And yes, there are those who succumb to the challenges that pandemic brought. I, at the time, I was leading one of the European insurance companies that have five companies operating in Indonesia during the pandemic period. In 2020, I was the country chief technology and transformation officer, and I was the crisis leader who looked after the five companies of AXA in Indonesia. 
AXA Services Indonesia, AXA Mandiri Financial Services, AXA Financial Indonesia, Mandiri AXA General and the investment arm of the company called Arkitas. These companies have a total of 2,000 plus employees, 2,000 plus sales force, 1,200 plus telesales and customer care offices and about 4.2 million customers. For four years, the company have established discipline and uh, operational resilience. We have tested it to get it to as real as possible, tested it with the worst scenario, but yet nothing like what the pandemic brought us you know, can prepare us for it. How fast things get escalated when patient 01 was first diagnosed in March of 2020. Within 22 days, uh, my team uh, and I were supported by Dell Technology to provide 911 laptops, 911, the number still sticks in my head, to yeah. all employees who did not have laptops. The, our cloud technology, such as our uh, telephone system, uh, we, we call the Genesis Pure Cloud, was ready to be switched on and to allow people from working from anywhere, to allow the 1,200 telemarketing offices to allow 1,200 call center offices to be able to serve our customer remotely. Our collaboration tools, since we constantly work with our global networks, are you know, we, we use collaboration tools from day to day. And when the pandemic comes, it just need to just switch and do and uh, use it more frequently. Our customer empowered technology were ready for the challenges. As you can see, you know, the company had exercised the technology ahead of time. And it worked out very well when the turbulent time comes. The technology team have exercised with technology, which is allowing us uh, to work from anywhere and to allow the customer self-servicing technology to run by itself. But who was not ready? If the technology is ready, then who was not ready? We all experienced the internet at the beginning was not ready. There was a boom. Suddenly, the use of technology or internet from home just exponentially increased. We experienced slowness. But that's the beginning, right? I mean, that's part of adapting to turbulences. Fortunately, within a few days, things just normalizes. Who else is not ready? People. People were not ready. We had to adapt to being tested, isolated, traced, right? We were forced to make adjustments. We were forced to spend more. We were forced to run with worst-case scenario. Our sales, expenses, and profitability were tested. But of course, because of many years of profitable uh, years in operations, prepared the company for times like this. But in the end, we made it. And it became a culture to be ready for a crisis and more importantly, ready to adapt. You know, pandemic prepared us, prepared the industry, the life insurance industry for what's coming next. The situation that I would like to explain uh, next is about the unit link saga. You know, life insurance industry experienced a very challenging period where one of the champion product in life insurance industry was challenged, was about to hit a dead end, was about to hit a sudden stop. The failure of several insurance companies to pay their investment commitment due to asset liability mismatch, the failure of insurance companies to properly invest third-party funds to secure the return required, have damaged, have tainted the market and customer trust. The balance of literacy and inclusion, which draw complaints. You know, people were buying things which they do not understand. You know, it, it drove demonstration. People were complaining. Even the people representative offices were involved. And this had really created turbulent time in Indonesia or the life insurance industry in Indonesia. Some of life insurance industry rely on uniting product as high as 80%, 80%, 80 of their company portfolio. And the the nightmare of having a moratorium or means a sudden stop of cash was just around the corner. A regulator stepped in. OJK, which last week just celebrated their 12th birthday, they stepped in. They discussed with the market players. They certainly looked to discuss what is, uh, what is best for both the customers and the industry. Thus, a new regulation on unit link was drafted. It was drafted to be launched in March 2023. March 14, the judgment day arrived. It was not a moratorium, so there was still chance. It was a new regulation where unit link product can still be sold, but with more complex process. Bare life was ready. But 
that's just half of the work that we need to do. At the end of 2020, BNLF is the second or third largest life insurance company in Indonesia from new business premium perspective. Berilaf have two strong shareholders, Bank BRI, Bank Rakyat Indonesia, which is one of the largest state-owned bank in Indonesia, and FWD Management Holding, which is the fastest growing Pan-Asia life insurance company. With BRI Life's uh, 26 sales office around the nation, with our 2,000 plus bank assurance financial advisors, with hundreds of our telemarketing, hundreds of employees, we were ready for these turbulences in our industry. Very Life, we had to remain focused to serve our 20 million plus customers in Indonesia. 20 million customers puts Very Life as the largest company uh, in terms of the number of customers in Indonesia. Very Life cannot fail our 20 million customers and our shareholder. March 14, we were ready. We make sure we can still sell. We understand that Unitlink will no longer be the champion product. We need to immediately have a replacement product. Shift our focus. Shift to protection. From investment focus to protection focus. This is one area that we need to change. Drastically change from setting investment product to protection product. What else? We also need to find new or other revenue channels. We need to target new segments or to be more focused on other segments. We optimize the existing channels of distribution, which is through our Brilink mobile partners who are selling our micro insurance product, are working with about 600,000 of Brilink again in bank bear in micro segment. These are the second area. What else? We expand our digital capability, distributing our products to Brimo, which is bank bear e super apps. And we continue to prepare for further changes in our Sharia business and begin to build our healthcare ecosystems. I guess you can say that we did not put our egg in one basket. But how is it possible? How is it that we, we are able to have this kind of mindset and how were we able to respond so quickly? First of all, it was the financial market uh, uh, regulators. We were able to adopt and survive because the regulatory agility and the collaboration with the market. You know, OJK responded to, this, to the situation very quickly. And in fact, just recently, OJK published the blueprint or peta biru, yeah, peta jalan of insurance development in Indonesia. This is a continuous effort of recovery and strengthening of the industry. So second, you know, what, 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 what are the things which help us to withstand the, the, the turbulences other than the, the, the regulatory uh, involvement? Bank Berry, uh, where Berry Life uh, uh, belong to, have adopted a risk-based strategy framework where our business plans, our strategy are being reviewed with ERM approach, where we make sure all the risk strategy is tested against our risk appetite and assess whether the strategy is suitable for our with our risk profile. And when executed, our plans and strategy, we need to make sure proper governance structure that we have or need to have is also adopted or implemented. The risk policy needs to be in place to support the implementation of the risk-based strategy and risk-based business plan to be monitored. It does not stop there. We need to make sure that it is cascaded down to all of our employees, whereby risk become a culture. Anyone in the companies walk the talk. And on a regular basis, risk modeling and analysis would be reviewed, supported by the required technology tools. Upon ensuring this framework is in place, we need to make sure that exercises, tests, and monitor are done on a regular basis. All strategy need to be reviewed and tested. Alternative strategy or tactic need to be in place. Recovery and resolution plan need to be written, established, and ready to be executed. When the time comes, decisions need to be made fast and implemented even quicker. Just to give you a taste of what happened back in 2022 before the regulatory came with the uh, OJK uh, unit link regulation. In September 2022, the risk management team have escalated our risk strategy reports to yellow, which means things is escalated. It requires attention. Strategic discussion to respond to the possible 
regulatory changes were accelerated and decision was made quickly to be prepared for possible deadline of March 14, where unit thing product will either be closed or will have new regulations. And when the new rules is implemented, we need to be to make sure that we are ready with possible enhancement, retraining, or re-engineering of our process. So we were prepared and made the necessary change to stay on track. As you can see, our numbers are still growing as we expected, not as big as we wanted it to be, but we are still growing as the market, most of the market are not experiencing uh, growth. So regulatory agility, enterprise risk management and readiness were the key success factors. Now, one other factor, which I believe uh, Mom Christina have, uh, have explained and a subject which is very close to her expertise, which is corporate governance and risk management. CGPI or the Corporate Governance Performance Index run by the IICG or Indonesian Institute of Corporate Governance. Uh, the coordinator, uh, Dr. Gendut Supraitno, explained how the IICG would adopt new focus on their approach to assess CGPI in Indonesia's corporation. As you can see, my apology, this is in Bahasa Indonesia. As you can see from time to time, they would adapt new theme, new focus to stay relevant with the market challenges where in 2022, the theme is agility enterprise, agility to make sure enterprise can be flexible, proactive and capable with agility to respond to market changes, market challenges, dynamic and even turbulent time. This is a theory adopted from uh, Deborah Ancona, Elaine Beckham and Kate Isaac in 2019. Nimble leadership walking the line between creativity and chaos. BRE Life is among the companies who participate in this assessment to make sure we have external parties to assess our readiness. So not just external having the culture, having the discipline. We wanted to make sure there is an external party who's, who uh, is able to provide feedback to our readiness to face challenging times. The enterprise agility is expected to make sure we are able to make smarter decisions, faster time to market, efficient use of our resources, faster decision, and of course, increased productivity. So what have you learned? Crisis is real. When it is real, imagine that it is real so that we can be prepared. Like this cartoon here, he's carrying just about everything that he needs to do to survive. Changes is certain. Like winter is coming. Yeah? Winter in some part of the world is certain. When we know it is certain, analyze the possible change. Anticipate the most likely change that, that may take place and act upon it. Make the proper uh, paper into a proof of concept. Make the proof of concept into a testing, a model, and be prepared to implement the model when the time comes. With all the experiences that we have, from pandemic, post-pandemic, you know, from storms, winds, jet streams, headwinds, tailwinds, we are now prepared. Prepared for new regulations, new challenges, you know, turbulent time or difficult time and challenges pushes for rapid changes, which will make way to new reality. The challenging time of unpredictability will pave a way to a new understanding for all of us. You know, the paradoxical time in regulatory frameworks we just open up way to new possibilities. We'll just unveil new strategy, new way of doing things for all of us. There will be turbulent time. You know, political year of 2024. Uh, in in our insurance industry, there is new minimum e uh, equity regulation for both life and general insurance. And yes, global political condition, which directly or indirectly impact Indonesia economies or financial market. But we are more prepared. I think. If I can illustrate the industry, it's like a big Boeing jet, right? A airliner, and we are prepared. Enterprise are adopting enterprise agility to adopt the change quickly. You know, today enterprise is not waiting for the change. We are making the change. You know, enterprise embraces sustainability mindset. We exercise with scenarios we can only dream about. The risk testing scenarios is more thorough now. Sustainability is not just a framework. It's a lifestyle. Sustainability is not just about environment, but governance and compliance to the very dot. Market innovations. You know, innovation are not done behind closed doors anymore. We make it public. We want to do it together. We want to collaborate and innovate. Regulators. 
you know, we hear about regulatory sandbox. We may see regulators were several steps behind, but today they're only a few steps behind, or what the song says, they're only two steps behind, or maybe one step. So in conclusion, the turbulent time is real, but it yields to new reality, new understanding. The reality, the reality that we must be prepared of, that we must capitalize. And yes, we are more prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yossi Iro. Very detailed explanation. So we know the answer to the land. Are we ready? We need for readiness with a crisis met management methodology. So Yossi has explained it very detailed through Access Service Indonesia and BRA Life. Uh, that have engaged in the crisis management project. And uh, how we do it, I capture with my handphone by enterprise agility, sustainability mindset, market innovation, and regulatory agility. Thank you very much for Mr. Yossi Iro. Is there any question in the chat room for him? Let me see. So everybody or participant, uh, write down your question and you'll see, we'll explain it in the chat room also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yossi. And now let us continue to the next speaker. Hello, Mr. Andreas Vijaya. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Dr. Rollins. Okay, we are here oh, yeah, okay. to introduce our esteemed speaker, Mr. Andreas Vijaya, SSE, MCE, and SC, PhD. is a, is an accomplished academic and professional with a rich background in computational science and physics currently affiliated with the Faculty of Information Technology in Universitas Kristen Maranata, Bandung. Dr. Yeah, Bijana. that's correct. Thank you. Really? Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Dr. Vijaya holds PhD from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, specialization in computational science. His academic journey also includes a master's degree in computational and theoretical physics and Bachelor of Science in Astronomy wow. from Institute Technology Bandung, Indonesia. The publications authored by Dr. Vijaya cover a diverse range of topics in the fields of computer science and information system, machine learning, software engineering, exploratory data analysis, showcasing his extensive research contribution in the expertise over the years. Okay, I will read the professional experience and achievements. Dr. Vijaya has a well experience in academia with a role ranging from lecturer to the leadership positions. He has contributed significantly to the Faculty of Information Technology at Universitas Kristen Advent in um, Universitas Kristen Maranata. So uh, I would like to be our guest lecturer in, in UNAI someday. Okay, since 2007, fostering growth and innovation in the field. His commitment to the quality assurance is evident in leadership roles, such as head of quality assurance and director of planning, monitoring, and quality assurance. Beyond academia, Dr. Vijaya is a recognized member of various professional organizations including the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and the International Associations of Engineers with the Microsoft Certified Educator, designation and numerous certifications in the area such as data, modeling, and software engineering. So Dr. Vijaya stands as a dedicated professional committed to the advancing education and technology in Indonesia. Now, let us get ready to hear Dr. Vijaya's presentation, and the time has come for you, Dr. Vijaya. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aliana, for the extensive introduction. 
such an honor to be introduced here. Thank you very much. Uh, I will present about, uh, well, connected to turbulence, about quantum computing, which is very trend nowadays in the world. So because of due to the uh, very short time period, so time constraint, I already made a video presentation about it so I can control and manage the time of the presentation. So for this, uh, thank you very much for the committee. Maybe uh, you can uh, play the presentation. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. I'm Andreas Vijaya. I'm from High Performance Computer Research Group from the Faculty of Information Technology, Universitas Kristen Maranatha. Thank you for the opportunity that I can have uh, this presentation for you today. And I will present about quantum computing with finest application. I hope you will enjoy this uh, presentation. Recently, quantum computing is very hot topic in the world. And as you can see here, Google officially lays claim to quantum supremacy. That means quantum computing has a very advantage against, well, our classical computer. This is also another physicist uh, in China. They have challenged Google quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. So this is very good to topic, I think, to talk about. So what is quantum computing? Quantum computing is a computation that takes advantage of quantum mechanical phenomena in physics. At very small scales, physical matter exhibits properties of both particles and waves, and quantum computing leverages this behavior, specifically quantum superposition and entanglement using specialized hardware that supports the preparation and manipulation of the quantum states. The word quantum itself comes from the Latin word for how much, as does quantity, something that is quantized. This term was coined by Max Planck in year about 1900. As you can see here, a very simplified diagram of an atom. As you can see here, these are orbital of electrons. And when electrons jump from this orbit to this orbit, orbit it will produce an energy of photon and this energy is quantized so this is quantum computing fields this is a venn diagram a rough representation of the overlapping fields so as you can see here big one is physics and we have quantum mechanics as a part of physics and quantum computing is a part of quantum mechanics and this field quantum computing fields overlap with also recent trends in artificial intelligence field which has machine learning and we have this the brown one is quantum ai quantum artificial intelligence and machine learning so this is most of the application of quantum computing So as you can see here, uh, the difference between our classical computing versus quantum computing. As you can see here, we have a bit. We have our computer works with bit, classical bit. It has two states only, which is zero and one. As opposed to quantum computing, which has quantum bit or qubit. And this quantum bit or qubit is a superposition of this both a zero state and one state in the form of this superposition. You can see this is a wave function, yeah, psi, as a superposition of zero state and one state, with alpha and beta as a coefficient, and this alpha and beta is a complex number. So this is one quantum computing for one qubit system. And as I stated before, that this is a superposition. Say if we have Hilbert vector space with standard basis, for example, to make it uh, simple, we have zero state, which has this is one zero factor, and one state, 
which has zero one factor. So and this will can be superposition, yeah, like this. And the a alpha and beta are complex number such as the alpha magnitude of alpha square and beta square equal one. So this is a sphere we call a block sphere to represent this as one uh, single qubit. So how we measure one qubit system? Since quantum computing follows quantum mechanics rule, so the result of the measurement is random with some probabilities. So when we measure, we only obtain one or just like classical bit of information. So if we measure a qubit with quantum state psi, say a superposition uh, of a zero factor and one factor with alpha and beta as complex coefficient, we will get zero state with probability of alpha square. Well, this is a magnitude of alpha square. And after collapse, the wave function collapse, then the psi will become a factor zero. And it will result one with probability of magnitude of beta square. And the new state will be psi equal factor one. So this phenomenon known as collapse of the wave function in quantum mechanics. So this is two qubit system. For example, if one qubit represents by zero or one vector, then two qubits have four possibilities. As you can see, this is the tensor product. Say this is zero uh, times zero, but this is a, a tensor product. So this multiplication is a tensor product. And zero and one, one and zero, and one and one. So we can denote this. Yeah, like this is simplification of the notation. So, so we have factor 0, 0, factor 0, 1, factor 1, 0, factor 1, 1. And of course, we can have superposition of these four factors like this. So we denote the coefficients with alpha 0, 0, alpha 0, 1, alpha 1, 0, and alpha 1, 1. So these four coefficients are complex numbers. And this has properties that... Uh, summation, uh, the, the sum of all uh, these complex numbers squared should be one. So su suppose we have state in this superposition, if we measure both qubits, we will obtain the zero zero state here with probability alpha zero zero squared. Well, this is the magnitude of the complex number. And the new state will be zero zero after collapsing of wave, wave function. And we will get 0, 1 with probability alpha 0, 1 square, and the new state will be vector 0, 1, and so on. So this is an analogous situation to what we had with one qubit, but now with four possibilities. So we can also measure just one qubit in two qubit system. So if we have state like this, we can also measure just one qubit. So if we measure the first qubit, say so the second one will be analogous, we will get zero with probability this alpha zero zero square plus alpha zero one square. So in that case, the new state of psi will be this, this form. And we will get one with probability alpha one zero square plus alpha one one square. So in that case, the new state psi will be this. For n qubit system, we have this form of wave function. As we can see here, there are two power to n terms, say from uh, alpha 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 uh, with factor 0, 0, 0, and so on, until alpha 1, 1, 1, 1, all 1 here with factor, uh, state factor 1, 1, 1, 1 here. So this is n qubit system. For one qubit system, we have all, uh, only two terms, which is uh, alpha and beta, or alpha zero and alpha one coefficient. With two qubit, we have four terms with four coefficients. And for three qubit, we have eight terms or eight coefficient. And if we continue, the qubit will go uh, exponentially as two power to n, say, 
if we have a uh, 32 qubit, we have uh, roughly around 4.3 billion terms. And if we have 64 qubit, we have this uh, large amount of terms. And this is beyond simulation. And I said so because uh, if we have small number, number amount of qubit, it can be simulated in classical computer. Yeah, say we have very powerful computer like supercomputer, we can simulate uh, this uh, n number of qubit system, but not with very large uh, number of qubit. For example, if we have 128 qubit, this is very, very, uh, very large amount of turn, which is beyond simulation. Of course, we don't have that amount of memory. And say uh, we have 256 qubit. Uh, this is ridiculously amount of uh, terms. Say we have 1.16 uh, times to 10 to power 77 term. This is of course beyond simulation. This is close to the number of atoms in our observable universe, which is uh, almost like 10 to power 78 or 10 to power 80. Well, that's uh, approximation number for the numbers of atoms in our observable universe. So quantum mechanics tell us that the evolution of an isolated state is given by Schrodinger equation in this form. So this is the Hamiltonian and this is the wave function. For quantum circuit, this implies that the operation that can be carried out are given by unitary matrices like this U. This U is a unitary matrices with properties like this. If, we, if U is multiplied with a U uh, dagger here, U dagger is uh, conjugate transpose and it will produce uh, identity identity matrix so as a consequences of this operation so we have an inverse that we call reversible computing so these are quantum gates we have x gate and we have z gate and we have y gate so these gates these gates are Pauli matrices in uh, quantum mechanics. So this is very special gates. It's H or Hadamard gate in this form, one over square root of two, one, 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 minus one. This is a Hadamard gate. This Hadamard gate is special because if we, uh, if we uh, apply this operation, this gate to uh, the quantum state, we will produce uh, this state, we will call Bell state, yeah? This is plus and minus state. We call this is Bell state. Yeah, this is entangled state of uh, qubits. So the other uh, gates are rotation gates, uh, R X, R Y, R G. This is rotation uh, about uh, X Y and Z axis. This is a tensor product of one qubit gate. So we can. Uh, apply this uh, tensor product, this tensor multiplication, uh, A and B are gates, for example, acting on uh, this uh, multiplication or product of these two states of the qubits. So in form of matrices, we can see uh, the tensor product will have form like this. So this is control node or C node gate. So C node gate, has the form of this matrix. It acting on two qubits, say Q and Q0, and it will flip bit one, bit uh, Q1, if Q0 is one. So why it's called control node. This is quantum entanglement. A state psi is a product state if it can be written in the form of this where psi1 and psi2 are two states of at least one qubit. An entangled state is a state that is not a product state, cannot be factored. For example, of entangled states are Bell states, like this form. Decoherence is the enemy of quantum computing. Deco decoherence can cause by, uh, say, interaction of the qubits with the environment say noise or high temperatures and everything that can cause uh, the loss of uh, quantum entanglement. So to cope with this uh, decoherence, quantum error correction is done. 
it can be used to prolong coherence length by correcting errors caused by caused by co the coherence. Quantum volume is to illustrate how useful the quantum computation is. As you can see here, if we adding more qubits, but the error rate is high, then quantum computing is less useful. But if the error is low, you can see the quantum volume is bigger. The more bigger quantum volume, then the more useful the quantum computation is. So here is the chart where this is limiting error rate and this is number of qubits. As you can see here, if the error rate is high, then this area is where the computation is useless because the a very high error rate. But here is useful. Here is the area where we can simulate the quantum computation because the number of qubits is small. And here we will have a near-term application. This is where we are now. And here is will be in the future where the useful error-corrected quantum computer can be done. This is an example of quantum circuit. So here we have a truth table quantum truth table and this is what we want to have this is a quantum circuit and this is the Hadamard gate this is C naught gate so we will apply this to illustrate how to uh, create say a bell state here so this is the algorithm we apply this Hadamard gate to two uh, qubits and then after that we apply the C naught gate and then we will measure the result. So this is the result, which is in Bell state. This is uh, quantum entanglement. So if we measure, then we will have probability to get this state, the 0, 0 state, 50% or half. And then the 1, 1 state, also 50% or half. If we run the circuit in uh, IBM Q, this is the uh, quantum computer made by IBM using Qiskit. Uh, the framework uh, by IBM we will have uh, this result so this is the result after we repeatedly measured say 1000 times so this is the circuit and then we measure in both qubits say 1000 times uh, after 1000 times measurement we will have say 49.3% uh, being zero zero state and 50.7% of 1,1 one, one state. So this is the diagram of complexity classes. Here is the quantum complexity classes. Here is generalization of NP problems. And the small one is NP problem, problem that can be quickly checked. And this is the pH, is the generalization of NP problem. And this is the small one, is these problems are quickly solvable by any classical computer. Here we have BQP bound error quantum polynomial time problems all problem that quantum computers can efficiently solve here there are problems that can be solved by quantum computer but not by classical computer even supercomputer here we have physical technologies for quantum computers there's a superconducting loops done by google and ibm and this is trap ions by ion q this is silicon quantum dots by Intel, and this is topological qubits by Microsoft and Bell Laboratories, and this is diamond vacancies by Quantum Diamond Technology. This is the roadmap of Google quantum computing. Here we are when Google have hundreds of logical qubit prototype, and then in the future, they will uh, develop one, one long leaf logical qubit at least here, where uh, short-lived qubits caused by the uh, coherence and then in the future they will develop error corrected quantum computing and also adding the number of qubits this is the roadmap of Honeywell quantum computing so you can see it's from linear until uh, large-scale quantum computation IBM scaling quantum technology also plan to improve the qubits also to improve the error correction. Scaling ion keys quantum computer is shown here. These are the numbers of algorithmic qubit. Means effective numbers of qubits for typical quantum algorithm. 
Quantum computing has also application for financial application. From 2004, Chen 2004 has proposed quantum binomial option pricing model. Here's the paper. And Ribet and Ross et al. 2018 proposed quantum algorithm for the Monte Carlo pricing of financial derivatives. And Aurel in 2021. He proposed a quantum work model for financial option. Eger et al. 2021 proposed credit risk analysis using quantum computers. Chen et al. 2023 proposed quantum approximate optimization algorithm for financial portfolio optimization. To conclude my talk, Quantum computing has the potential to revolutionize various fields including finance and bring about significant advancement in technology and society. Finally, at the end of my talk, I would like to read a quote from chaos theory in mathematics known as the butterfly effect that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can ultimately cause a typhoon or turbulence halfway around the world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Doctor. Wow, uh, impressive. Yeah, uh, we know how uh, the codes and also the formulation that you explained explain just now. And uh, it will be uh, prepared for an AI application for the financial uh, strategic or uh, businesses. So I will make it simple maybe for the ordinary person like us i know how to use computer but don't know the inside how to do it so a uh, multi uh, quantum computing it's a multidisciplinary consisting a computer science physics and mathematics that utilize quantum mechanics am i correct Doctor That's correct. Vijaya? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, relatively new fields now. Uh -huh, yeah, it that's... harness the power of quantum mechanics, the physics that we know now, to mm -hmm. power the computation that can be used in every aspect of our life. That's amazing. Yeah. So we have Very to be ready amazing. for this turbulence. Yes. So quantum computing might transform finance also, yeah? And quantum algorithms. Algorithms, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's a oh, little in my mouth. It's okay, yeah. <laughs> Can optimize portfolio management, also improving risk assessment and also investing methods. So very nice, very clear explanation from you, Dr. Vijaya. And as usual, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So as usual, uh, my pleasure. I have a question to ask. Just write down in the chat room and Dr. Andreas Vijaya will answer it. Okay, we proceed to another um, speaker. Yeah, this is the speaker is from UNAI, yeah, Dr. Harman Malau MM, holding a bachelor degree in theology from Universitas Aten Indonesia, Bandung a bachelor's degree in economics from IBMI Bandung, a master's in management from TUP Manila, and PhD from Santo Tomas Manila. He exemplifies a commitment to education and continuous learning. Dr. Malau is married to the accomplished doc doctor, or yeah, Dr. Joyce Tobing, SPOG, an obstetrics and gynecology specialist. Their three children, including Dr. Rahel Maya Malau and Dr. Gary Armando, showcase a family dedicated to the medical profession and education. Dr. Malau's extensive service experience includes pastoral roles, six years in the chaplain at Rumah Sakit Aten Bandung, and over a decade as a lecturer in UNAI. 
his leadership roles ranging from head of personnel to dean of the Faculty of Economics culminated in his current position as a chairman of Unai Foundation. Dr. Haman Malau's journey reflects a position for education, service, and leadership within the Unai community. Okay, the time is yours, Dr. Haman Malau. Hadirin yang terhormat, selamat datang dalam seminar yang berfokus pada tema yang sangat relevan, Managing Turbulences Marketing Perspective. Hari ini, kita akan menyelami dunia pemasaran yang penuh dengan dinamika dan perubahan. Turbulensi dalam lingkungan pemasaran adalah suatu kenyataan yang tak terhindarkan. Dan tujuan kita hari ini adalah tidak hanya untuk memahaminya, tetapi juga untuk mengelolanya dengan bijaksana. Mari kita lihat apa pengertian dari turbulensi pemasaran. Turbulensi pemasaran merujuk pada kondisi yang dinamis, kompleks, dan terus berubah dalam lingkungan pemasaran bisnis. Turbulensi pemasaran mencakup gejolak dan ketidakpastian yang mempengaruhi strategi pemasaran, memaksa organisasi untuk terus beradaptasi agar tetap relevan dan kompetitif. Dalam konteks ini, perusahaan dihadapkan pada tuntutan untuk merespon perubahan pasar dengan cepat, mengidentifikasi peluang baru, dan mengelola risiko yang muncul. Turbulensi pemasaran mengacu pada perubahan dan ketidakpastian yang terjadi dalam lingkungan pemasaran suatu perusahaan. Setiap perusahaan tentu mengharapkan agar perusahaan itu dapat berjalan stabil tanpa ada gangguan lingkungan pemasaran. Itu sebabnya bahwa turbulensi ini merupakan hal yang tidak diinginkan karena mengandung muatan ketidakpastian. Dalam beberapa tahun terakhir ini, misalnya, lingkungan bisnis global telah mengalami perubahan yang sangat cepat. Faktor-faktor seperti perubahan ekonomi, dinamika politik, perkembangan teknologi, dan situasi kesehatan global telah menciptakan turbulensi yang tinggi. Oleh karena itu, perusahaan-perusahaan harus memiliki pemahaman mendalam tentang konteks bisnis mereka dan mempersiapkan strategi pemasaran yang responsif terhadap setiap turbulensi-turbulensi yang ada. Dengan memahami turbulensi pemasaran, maka organisasi dapat mengembangkan strateginya supaya lebih efektif dan juga adaptif, memanfaatkan peluang pasar yang muncul dan mempertahankan daya saing mereka di tengah-tengah lingkungan bisnis yang dinamis dan yang tidak pasti ini. Sekarang mari kita lihat apa yang menyebabkan turbulensi ini. Penyebab turbulensi pemasaran atau indikator apa yang membuat turbulensi ini. Indikator turbulensi pemasaran dapat bervariasi tergantung pada faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi industri dan pasar tertentu. Namun beberapa indikator yang umum dapat mengisyaratkan adanya turbulensi pemasaran itu ada beberapa hal ya. Yang pertama, Perubahan tren penjualan. Apa yang dimaksud dengan perubahan tren penjualan? Ini adalah penurunan yang terjadi secara tiba-tiba atau fluktuasi dalam penjualan atau produk atau layanan. Itu yang pertama. Sementara yang kedua adalah peningkatan persaingan. Peningkatan aktivitas persaingan baik dalam bentuk pesaing baru, ada pendatang baru, atau perubahan strategi pesaing yang ada. Ini juga merupakan peningkatan persaingan yang menyebabkan adanya turbulensi. Lalu yang berikutnya adalah perubahan harga. Perubahan harga yang dimaksud adalah perubahan harga yang tiba-tiba dalam harga produk atau harga layanan. Baik oleh perusahaan itu sendiri atau pesaing. Ini dapat mencerminkan usaha untuk menyesuaikan dengan perubahan kondisi pasar. Nomor empat, bagian yang keempat adalah terjadi pergeseran tren konsumen. Apa yang dimaksud dengan tren konsumen? Ini adalah perubahan dalam preferensi konsumen atau tren pasar yang mencolok dapat menjadi indikator adanya turbulensi. Ini dapat mencakup pergeseran nilai-nilai konsumen atau perubahan dalam cara konsumen menggunakan produk itu. Yang berikutnya, pengenalan produk baru. Maksudnya produk atau layanan baru di pasar dapat menciptakan ketidakpastian dan meningkatkan persaingan, terutama jika produk tersebut menggeser permintaan dari produk yang sudah ada. Lalu yang berikutnya adalah perubahan dalam regulasi atau kebijakan. Perubahan dalam peraturan pemerintah 
atau kebijakan industri ini dapat menciptakan turbulensi. Ini mencakup misalnya perubahan regulasi yang mempengaruhi produksi misalnya atau perubahan re, uh, sorry regulasi yang uh, mempengaruhi distribusi atau pemasaran produk. Yang nomor tujuh, fluktuasi ekonomi. Apa yang dimaksud dengan fluktuasi ekonomi di sini? Fluktuasi ekonomi ini adalah gangguan ekonomi seperti resesi, inflasi, dan depresi. Ini dapat menciptakan ketidakpastian dalam pemasaran dengan mempengaruhi daya beli konsumen dan kepercayaan bisnis. Nomor delapan, respon pelanggan yang meningkat. Apa yang dimaksud dengan respon pelanggan? Yaitu keluhan-keluhan pelanggan yang meningkat atau perubahan dan umpan balik pelanggan ini dapat menjadi indikator adanya masalah atau perubahan dalam persepsi. Nomor sembilan, perubahan dalam posisi pesaing. Jika pesaing mengubah strategi mereka, memperkenalkan produk baru, atau mencapai keunggulan kompetitif, hal ini dapat menciptakan gangguan atau ketidakpastian, atau kita sebut dengan turbulensi lingkungan di dalam pemasaran. Yang terakhir adalah perubahan dalam lingkungan bisnis global. Ini adalah faktor-faktor global, seperti perubahan dalam kebijakan perdagangan internasional, ketidakstabilan geopolitik, atau perubahan dalam kondisi ekonomi yang sifatnya global atau menyeluruh. Sekarang mari kita lihat yang sangat penting, sangat perlu, bagaimana mengelola turbulensi marketing ini. Mengelola turbulensi di dalam pemasaran adalah tantangan yang kompleks dan tergantung pada berbagai faktor, termasuk faktor industri, faktor perusahaan, dan juga dinamika pasar. Saya memberikan beberapa strategi umum yang dapat diterapkan oleh perusahaan untuk mengelola turbulensi pemasaran ini. Yang pertama adalah perusahaan itu atau kita harus membuat analisa pasar yang mendalam. Itu poin yang pertama. Buat analisis pasar yang mendalam. Apa yang dimaksud dengan ini adalah lakukan analisis pasar secara teratur untuk memahami perubahan tren konsumen, kebutuhan pasar, dan dinamika pesaing. Informasi ini dapat membantu perusahaan merespon perubahan-perubahan itu yang lebih cepat dan juga tepat. Saya akan memberikan beberapa langkah yang dapat diambil untuk menganalisis pasar ya secara mendalam. Nomor satu misalnya, lakukan penelitian pasar. Apa yang dimaksud dengan ini? Sebagai contoh, melakukan survei konsumen atau wawancara untuk memahami preferensi, untuk memahami kebutuhan dan perilaku pembeli dari target pasar. Kemudian kita buat analisis segmen pasar. Menganalisis segmen pasar untuk mengidentifikasi kelompok konsumen dengan karakteristik dan kebutuhan yang serupa. Seperti analisis demografis, analisis geografis, dan juga analisis perilaku. Lalu yang berikutnya kita analisis juga persaingan. Menilai mana yang menjadi kekuatan dan juga kelemahan dari saingan kita. Kita identifikasikan posisi itu di dalam pasar. Lalu kita analisis strategi pemasaran dan juga produk saingan kita. Yang berikutnya, kita menganalisis juga tren industri. Apa yang dimaksud dengan tren industri itu artinya memantau tren industri yang dapat mempengaruhi pasar. Seperti kemajuan teknologi, perubahan regulasi, atau pergeseran dalam preferensi konsumen. Yang berikutnya ini adalah analisis SWOT. Ini sangat umum yaitu strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Contoh ya, kita mengidentifikasi kekuatan internal perusahaan, misalnya merek yang kuat. Kemudian kita mau melihat kelemahan dari perusahaan itu, misalnya rantai pasokan yang rentan. Kita lihat juga peluangnya, misalnya pangsa pasar yang belum dimanfaatkan. Lalu kita melihat apa ini yang menjadi ancaman, misalnya persaingan yang intensif. Nah, sekarang kita melihat analisis yang berikutnya, yaitu kita buat analisis posisi produk atau merek. Contoh, mengevaluasi bagaimana produk atau merek Anda berdiri di pasar. Apa yang membedakannya dari saingan Anda? Dan bagaimana hal tersebut diposisikan dalam pikiran konsumen? Ini sangat penting. Kemudian yang berikutnya, kita lakukan juga analisis pengaruh eksternal. Artinya yang bagian luar, ya memahami faktor-faktor eksternal seperti perubahan ekonomi, perubahan kebijakan pemerintah, atau perubahan tren budaya yang dapat mempengaruhi pasar. Dan semua ini di luar dari perusahaan kita. Makanya disebutkan pengaruh eksternal. Nah sekarang kita lihat juga analisis harga dan penawaran. 
Contoh, menganalisis harga produk atau layanan Anda serta penawaran produk pesaing untuk memahami dinamika harga dan nilai yang diberikan kepada konsumen. Kemudian kita analisis juga rantai pasokan. Apa yang dimaksud dengan rantai pasokan? Kita mengevaluasi kestabilan dan efisiensi rantai pasokan, mengidentifikasi resiko dan peluang untuk peningkatan efisiensi. Lalu yang bagian terakhir dalam hal analisis ini, yaitu analisis media sosial dan umpan balik pelanggan. Ini sangat penting, media sosial. Jadi memantau misalnya ini, contoh, kita pantau percakapan-percakapan yang di media sosial, ulasan-ulasan pelanggan, dan umpan balik online untuk memahami persepsi pelanggan terhadap produk Anda, terhadap produk kita, terhadap merek kita. Itulah bagian analisis. Sekarang nomor dua kita perlu memperhatikan fleksibilitas strategis. Apa yang dimaksud dengan fleksibilitas strategis? Fleksibilitas strategis itu mengacu pada kemampuan suatu organisasi untuk menyesuaikan diri dengan perubahan lingkungan, merespon peluang atau tantangan baru, dan mengubah strategi bisnis sesuai dengan kebutuhan. Oke, berikut ini ada beberapa aspek fleksibilitas strategi, dan ada juga contoh-contoh nanti yang akan saya kasih ya. Yang pertama, adaptabilitas strategi. Adaptabilitas berasal dari kata adapt. Contoh nih, sebuah perusahaan teknologi, misalnya ya, yang awalnya mereka fokus pada pengembangan perangkat keras misalnya, dapat dengan cepat beralih ke pengembangan perangkat lunak. Jadi beradaptasi ketika trade industri bergerak menuju solusi berbasis perangkat lunak. Kemudian penting inovasi. Inovasi produk dan layanan, sebuah perusahaan e-commerce yang terus berinovasi dalam portfolio produk atau layanannya, merespon perubahan tren konsumen dan teknologi, itu akan tetap relevan di mana? Di pasar. Lalu perlu fleksibilitas operasional. Sebuah rantai restoran cepat saji misalnya, yang memiliki kemampuan untuk mengubah menunya atau menyusun ulang proses operasional secara efisien untuk mengakomodasi perubahan dalam selera pelanggan atau persyaratan regulasi. Jadi perlu ada fleksibilitas di bagian operasional. Lalu bagian D, kemampuan beradaptasi dengan teknologi baru. Ini sangat penting. Teknologi selalu baru, selalu ada. Dengan cepat. Bagaimana kemampuan kita, kemampuan perusahaan untuk bisa beradaptasi? Nah, sebuah perusahaan manufaktur yang terus mengadopsi teknologi produksi canggih untuk meningkatkan efisiensi dan kualitas produk ini akan uh, bisa mengejar uh, teknologi baru itu sendiri. Supaya sesuai dengan uh, usaha yang sedang dijalankan. Jadi teknologi itu itu harus membantu dan menolong perusahaan itu untuk efisiensi dan juga efektivitas. Itu intinya ya, teknologi baru. Nah sekarang kita lihat yang berikutnya, uh, kemitraan dan aliansi strategis. Contoh nih, sebuah perusahaan teknologi yang membentuk kemitraan dengan perusahaan lain untuk meningkatkan kapabilitas atau memperluas jangkauan pasar. Sehingga dapat beradaptasi dengan cepat terhadap perubahan pasar. Lalu yang berikutnya, manajemen talenta. Ini mengenai fleksibilitas semua ya. Manajemen talenta dan keterlibatan karyawan. Contoh, sebuah perusahaan yang memiliki karyawan yang terlatih dengan baik dan memiliki keterlibatan tinggi, memungkinkan mereka untuk lebih mudah beradaptasi dengan perubahan dan memberikan kontribusi terhadap inovasi. Ada yang perlu lagi, yaitu penggunaan data dan analitik. Data itu sangat penting, karena data itu merupakan suatu fakta ya. Jadi, contohnya sebuah perusahaan e-commerce yang memanfaatkan analitik data untuk memahami perilaku konsumen, merespon tren pasar, dan menyusukan strategi pemasaran secara real-time, ini akan lebih maju tentunya. Apa yang dimaksud dengan manajemen risiko yang efektif? Sebuah bank yang memiliki kebijakan manajemen risiko yang kuat, memungkinkannya untuk merespon dengan cepat terhadap perubahan kondisi ekonomi atau regulasi yang dapat mempengaruhi bisnisnya. Lalu bagian yang terakhir di dalam fleksibilitas ini adalah uh, pentingnya pengembangan keterampilan dan kompetensi. Contoh sebuah perusahaan, perusahaan teknologi yang menginvestasikan waktu dan sumber dayanya untuk mengembangkan keterampilan dan potensi baru dalam organisasinya. Itu memungkinkannya untuk bergerak ke segmen pasar yang berkembang. Nah sekarang bagian nomor tiga, tadi yang pertama menganalisis, kemudian fleksibilitas, nah sekarang kita di bagian yang ketiga adalah investasi dalam inovasi. Apa yang dimaksud dengan investasi? 
yaitu fokus pada inovasi produk dan layanan untuk tetap relevan dan menarik bagi pelanggan. Berinvestasi dalam riset dan pengembangan dapat membantu perusahaan mengantisipasi tren dan kebutuhan pasar. Lalu yang berikutnya, pemasaran digital dan online. Manfaatkan pemasaran digital dan online untuk mencapai audiensi yang lebih luas, meningkatkan visibilitas merek, dan memanfaatkan analitik untuk memahami perilaku konsumen. Lalu nomor lima, kemitraan dan aliansi. Apa yang dimaksud dengan ini? Pertimbangkan untuk membentuk kemitraan atau aliansi strategis dengan perusahaan lain. Kemitraan ini dapat membantu membagi resiko dan meningkatkan daya saing. Lalu yang berikutnya adalah nomor enam, penggunaan teknologi terkini. Manfaatkan ter teknologi terkini. Seperti kecerdasan buatan, ini yang kita kenal dengan AI, ya AI sekarang ini ada chat GPT. Nah, kita menggunakan teknologi terkini, lalu kita buat analit data teknologi digital lainnya untuk meningkatkan efisiensi operasional dan mengoptimalkan strategi pemasaran itu sendiri. Lalu yang nomor tujuh, manajemen risiko yang efektif. Risiko itu tidak bisa dihindarkan, tapi bisa dimanage. Identifikasi, diidentifikasi dan dievaluasilah risiko yang mungkin muncul dalam strategi pemasaran selanjutnya. Buat rencana darurat dan strategi mitigasi untuk mengatasi risiko tersebut. Nomor delapan, orientasi pelanggan yang kuat. Bangun hubungan yang kuat dengan pelanggan. Pelanggan itu sangat penting, kita bangun hubungan yang kuat. Dengan memahami kebutuhan dan preferensi mereka, pelanggan-pelanggan ini, dan juga perusahaan dapat lebih mudah menyesuaikan produk dan layanan mereka dengan perubahan pasar. Nomor sembilan, pengambilan keputusan berbasis data. Gunakan data, gunakan analitik untuk mendukung pengambilan keputusan. Informasi yang akurat dan real time dapat membantu perusahaan mengidentifikasi peluang dan juga risiko yang lebih baik. Yang berikutnya adalah kreativitas dan responsif terhadap pelanggan, yaitu galakkan budaya kreativitas di perusahaan itu, responsif terhadap umpan balik pelanggan, jangan lama-lama. Kemudian kemampuan untuk beradaptasi dengan kebutuhan pelanggan adalah kunci kesuksesan dalam menghadapi turbulensi pemasaran. Sebagai kesimpulannya, mengatasi turbulensi pemasaran membutuhkan kombinasi strategi yang kokoh, keterampilan adaptasi, dan pemantauan yang cermat terhadap perubahan pasar. Perusahaan yang dapat beradaptasi dengan cepat dan efektif terhadap perubahan lingkungan bisnis akan memiliki peluang yang lebih besar untuk berhasil dalam mengatasi turbulensi pemasaran. Demikian, terima kasih. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Herman Malau. I will conclude the explanation. Uh, effective marketing turbulence management needs flexibility. Marketing resilience is needed. Marketing resilience involves adjustment to change, to innovate and grow. Be proactive, data driven, and adaptive to win in the ever changing market landscape. Okay. Before I hand it back to the MC, Dr. Valentin, I want to share a good news. Yes. Okay. Uh, for all participants who already asked the question, I have written down all your names, and Unai will send you a gift of love. So, the term of conditions is: please send your bank account number to. Can you write down, ma'am or Dr. Valentin Siagian's WhatsApp number plus six two eight five one three two four zero six seven six seven or to me, Roliana plus six two eight one eight six four one five six three. One more time. Uh, Dr. Valentin's WhatsApp number plus six two eight five one three two four zero six seven six seven 
and to my number, my WhatsApp number, last 6281-641-563. And the names are, I think this is Dr. Andreas Wijaya, yeah, because you asked the question before, and then Jacob Henriksson, Mahendra, Melinda Rantu, Joel Rorim Pandey, Yos Henki Sagala, Mephi um, Lumin Kewas. Okay, I will read again. Dr. Andreas Wijaya, Jacob Hendrickson, Mahendra Melinda Rantu, Joel Rorim Pandey, Yos Henki Sagala, and Mephi Lumin Kewas. So send your. Uh, account number bank account number and then i will we will we will we will we will uh, send a token of love from us uh, for you okay now uh, dr valentin i have completed all my assignment so each speaker has provided a clear explanation of the material and we all acquired a num numerous insights Dr. Robin Chan, Mrs. Christina Orbeta, Dr. Benny B. Chandrasa, Mr. Yossi Irod, and Dr. Andres Vijaya, and Dr. Harman Malau. Thank you for your willingness to impart your expertise despite the demands of your busy schedules is greatly appreciated. So we really appreciate it very much. Dr. Valentin. The time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Roliana, for leading the six speakers in the six session that has contributed a significant lesson for each one of us. I believe all the participants today uh, agree that we received many lessons that will be useful for us. And now I would like to invite Dr. Judith Sinaga to give the symbolic flag for all an appreciation for all the speakers and also um, our moderator. Okay. Where's Peter? Peter? Peter. Okay. First and foremost, I would like to thank you all the speakers. It's uh, We are indebted to all of you for the knowledge that you had shared to us this morning. Uh, we, have, we want to say thank you, Dr. Robin, uh, Mom Christina, Dr. Benny, uh, Sir Eros, Dr. Andreas, and uh, Dr. Mano, and also we want we would like to say thank you for the master of ceremony, our, uh, our moderator, and all the participants who, who your presence is highly appreciated. And now we're going to give the certificate of appreciation. Certificate of appreciation is presented to Robin Chen, PhD, as guest speaker in international webinar Managing Turbulences, Academicians and Practitioners Perspective, given this 20th day, November 2023, Universitas Advent Indonesia, and signed by Pastor Dr. Milton Pardosi, MAR, President of Universitas Advent Indonesia, and signed by Dr. Judith T.G. Sinaga as the Organizing Committee Head. Thank you very much. Please accept our certificate, Dr. Robin. He's not here anymore. Okay, let's have uh, the next certificate. Okay, another certificate of appreciation. Uh, this certificate of appreciation is presented to Christina Orbeta. MPA as our guest speaker for this international webinar, Managing Turbulence 
academicians and practitioner perspective given this 26th day November 2023 Universitas Advent Indonesia signed by Pastor Dr. Milton Pardosi, the University President and Dr. Judith T.G. Sinaga. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sina. Hope to see you when uh, I go home again to the Philippines. Thank you, ma'am, Christina. Okay. Next. Another certificate of appreciation is presented to Dr. Benny Chandrasa, SAMM, as guest speaker in international webinar, Managing Turbulences, Academicians and Practitioners Perspective, given this 26th day, November 2023, Universitas Advent Indonesia, signed by Pastor Dr. Milton Pardosi, MAR, President of Universitas Advent Indonesia, and Dr. Juriti G. Sinaga. Thank, Thank you, you Sir Benny, Dr. Benny. Thank you very much. Okay. Another certificate. Next is for uh, Yossi Iroth. Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Yossi Iroth as a MM candidate as guest speaker in international webinar, Managing Turbulences, Amer Academicians and Practitioners Perspective, given this 26th day, November 2023, Universitas Advent Indonesia, signed by Pastor Dr. Milton Pardosi, MAR, and Dr. Judith T.G. Sinaga, BSH, MBA. Next, another one is given to another certificate is given to Sir Yossi, accept our certificate. <laughs> Thank you. <man. laughs> okay. Uh, another one is given to Mr. Andreas Vijaya. Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Andreas Vijaya, SSI, MCE, MSC, PhD as guest speaker in International Webinar Managing Turbulences, Academicians and uh, Practitioners Perspective, given this 26th day, November 2023, Universitas Advent Indonesia, signed by Pastor Dr. Milton Pardosi, MAR, and Dr. Judith T.G. Sinaga, BSAC, MBA. Accept our certificate, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Judith Sinaga. Thank you so much. And another one is given to... Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Harman Malau, PhD, as guest speaker in international webinar managing Turbulences, academicians, and practitioners' perspective given this 26th day, November 2023, Universitas Advent Indonesia, signed by Pastor Dr. Milton Pardo, CMAR, President, Universitas Advent Indonesia, and Dr. Judith T.G., BSAC, MBA, the organizing committee head. Sir, please accept this. Are you here? Also, those are the participants, uh, the guest speaker. Thank you, Ma'am Valentin. For the plot of appreciation for all our speakers, I would like also to read for uh, the certificate of appreciation for our moderator. Operator, please help me uh, show the certificate for our moderator. Uh, this certificate is given of appreciation is presented to Dr. Roliana Ferinia Seboya, PhD, um, Dr. Roliana Ferinia Seboya, MM, as moderator in international webinar, uh, Managing Turbulences and Academicians and Practitioners Perspective, given this 26th day, November 2023, Universitas Advent Indonesia will be signed by our president, Dr. Milton Pardesi, MAR, and also uh, our dean and organizing committee as well, Dr. Judith Sinaga. Please receive the Thank you. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Once again, thank you so much for all our speakers, our moderator, our participants. Uh, thank you for all the engaging session. And I would like also to appreciate the uh, our organizing committee. Thank you, Ma'am Judith, for organizing all of this uh, international uh, webinar, especially to our sponsor, uh, BRI Live. Thank you for your contribution. And as we wrap up, let's quickly uh, recap the key takeaways from today's insightful decisions. And congratulations for all of you who received the DAR prize as well. And as a reminder for those who haven't filled in the attendance list, please fill it to receive the e-certificate. And please keep an eye out for the follow-up email that will be given to you. Now, to close our program, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Roni Sihotang for a closing prayer. Okay, let us pray. I will, I will pray in Christian prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the time that you have given to us in, in this afternoon, especially after finishing the topic of seminar managing turbulence. Thank you for all the speakers, as well as also for all participants who are with here in this seminar. Bless all that activity, bless all our family, especially our university here, Universal Art Fan Indonesia. We surrender to all to you in life life. And Please bless us. If we have the turbulence, we can manage it according to their will. Thank you, Lord, for being us today. We pray to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir, for the prayer. Once again, we hope you found this session enlightening and look forward to seeing you all in our future events. Thank you for joining us and have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. A pleasant day to all. The Faculty of Business Universitas Advent Indonesia aims to educate business students with professionalism and develop competence. The Faculty of Business equips students with strong leadership skills and train them to be a socially and morally responsible individuals. The Faculty of Business integrates faith, character, and learning Thus, values are embedded on them, thus making them contributor to the development of Indonesian society. At the Faculty of Economics, Universitas Advent Indonesia, students will learn about resource management strategies by considering their efficiency in attaining prosperity. The resources are not merely about money or costs, but also natural resources time, and even energy. In the accounting study program, students will learn materials related to methods of journaling and preparing financial reports that are useful for the stakeholder in the decision-making process. Students will also learn management, tax section, information system, and auditing. And for Master of Management, Students will learn how to manage a company or organization, wherein management focus more on managing and planning all the process within company or organization to achieve goals. The Faculty of Economics of the Universitas Advent Indonesia also provides various learning facilities such as manual accounting labs and computer labs and of course, with quality teaching staff from reputable universities, both local and abroad, to help the learning process become better and efficient in preparing us for the future work. Students and graduates of Economic Faculty of Universitas Advent Indonesia are trained to carry out community services by implementing economic, both 
accounting and management and professional that they are able to meet the needs in community life, the world, business and government. For all prospective students who are still confused about where to study and are interested in taking up economics, accounting, or management, let's join us at Universitas Advent Indonesia, where your dreams will be your success. Bapak Ibu panelis boleh bergabung di breakout room ya, yang breakout room satu. Terima kasih.